Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I think we're going to get started now. Hi there, and welcome to the board meeting for Wednesday, September 28th of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. I'm Kim DeSerpa, your board president, and I welcome you to the meeting tonight. If there are anyone here that wants to speak on anything on the agenda or speak under the section for um, public comments that are non agendized, you need to fill out one of the yellow cards in the back and bring the card up to um, Eva, who will pass it to us and we'll call your name when that agenda item comes up. If you need translation tonight, we do have our district translator here, Urania Lopez and she'll be happy to provide you with translation. Um, si se ocupan um, servicios de traducción, la señora Orania López le puede ayudar con ese um, servicio. Thank you. Um, we'll start out tonight with the Pledge of Allegiance and we'll have Trustee Dodge Jr. lead us tonight in the pledge. Thank you. Thank you. And next on our agenda, we have comments from our superintendent, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yeah, thanks so much. So I just want to give recognition to um, Jen Little, Little Tim Bruno, who um, helped to ensure that we had a fantastic um, first ELOP in, um, intercession Saturday. So we are doing Saturdays now with our um, with all of our families. And so here you're going to see some pictures um, that we're going to put up of what actually was happening with our families families this Saturday. So we had something that was called the Pajaro Passport Intercessions Offerings. Um, and so the first one you saw was um, a boardwalk fall camp out. There was also YMCA day camps that families were able to send their children to, science workshops, and you can just keep going, thanks, science workshops, art council, um, family dan um, dance classes, and the Roaring Camp Western night. And so we have many of these coming up in the future. Um, and so please make sure we're having approximately one a month um, for the next several months. And so if you are a family out there that wants to have a really wonderful experience for their child, some of them are families and children, and some of them are just children um, by themselves, then we really encourage you to sign up and take take part in these days. So this is part of our requirement to do 30 additional instructional days. And so we are doing six of these on Saturday. And so um, Jen always does it in style and she does it with tons of community partners. Um, and it was no exception this time. So thanks, um, Jim Bruno, for, for that work. Um, so let's give her a round of applause. Um, and then, um, we are, um, Trustee Shocker and myself, we have been working with um, city, um, city council and also our county supervisors in order to be able to do community leader for the day. Um, we had tons of students that applied and I, because I had so many students apply to me, I selected two instead of one. Um, and so I am going to be having um, Mia Ruiz from Aptos High School and and um, Andrew Avarado from Watsonville High School are going to be meeting with me on and shadowing me on October 4th. We have a lot of great things happening, um, including site visits and also a virtual meeting with Take Action Stop Violence Community Group. And then probably the highlight, um, we are meeting with Senator Laird um, for lunch and um, a walkthrough of our wellness center. Um, and so it should be a really great day for those two. I did let all the other students know that had applied that couldn't be it, um, that I was sorry that they couldn't be part of it. Many of them are part of my superintendent advisory group though, and so I will be engaging with them just in a different process. So thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, we're gonna have board comments next on the agenda and we'll start, I think, down on my left with um, Trustee Holm. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I did another site visit to Rio Del Mar Elementary with, along with uh, Dr. Rodriguez, and we met with parents and uh, members of the Site Council and Parent Alliance. We discussed various projects and uh, priorities, so it was a good conversation you know, about you know, with all various stakeholders for that. I also attended our um, SELPA uh, um, CAC, and we talked about the IEP process and the new state guidelines around that committee. So keeping it short and sweet because I know we got a lot to cover tonight. Thank you, Trustee Soto. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Thank you for attending tonight's meeting. Uh, I want to apologize for my absence last meeting. Uh, I was feeling under the weather and I didn't want to uh, infect anybody else with whatever may have uh, been bugging me that evening. But uh, we're here tonight and uh, let's get on with the meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Trustee Orozco. Good evening, everyone. Thank you uh, for joining us this evening. Um, I had a couple of committee meetings. We had our, our green team meeting, and uh, the next meeting we will be discussing um, the green team kits and what that means, what they entail, and hopefully in collaboration with the city of Watsonville and their uh, green team initiatives there, we will be able to provide uh, green team kits to those schools who want to initiate a green team at their school. Um, and we also had a further discussion on the possibility of expanding the farm to um, cafeteria program, and I know that's still up in the air and for further discussion. I also attended the food wet benefit dinner um, a couple weeks back, I wanna say, and it was, uh, which is really phenomenal to be able to uh, hear testimonials from different students who uh, attend our schools and how that program has benefited their lives. And in some cases, um, been, it's been a, just a life-changing experience overall. Um, so that was really great. Um, I also got the opportunity to participate on the Empower Watsonville panel conversation on policy making and community organizing. So that was really exciting. Uh, there were other community members, including uh, Dr. Rodriguez present too. Um, so it's always good to just interact with our youth and figure out ways um, to support them. And uh, I think their focus this time around will be a, uh, around substance. Um, abuse um, in youth and how we can um, just come together as a community to provide alternatives to um, youth who uh, are turning to substance abuse for various reasons. And again, well, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Trustee Shocker. Thank you. I also attended our green team meeting, so I'm not gonna repeat what Maria said. Um, we also had our migrant head start meeting, um, talking about the need, still, still um, looking for um, family daycare practitioners. So if you know anyone in the community who wants to apply to the migrant head start program, that would be great. And we're also looking for a teacher in the migrant head start program. And then um, also attended a meeting with Watsonville Police Activities League for a community event. They're to put on um, both at the Youth Center on November 1st and at the Davis Center on November 2nd, um, celebrating Dia de los Muertos. And there'll be activities for the community, they'll be playing the movie Coco, so everyone's invited. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Acosta. Um, thank you. I just wanted to um, take a moment and acknowledge um, the Santa Cruz Triathlon Association. This last Sunday, they hosted the 40th annual uh, Santa Cruz Triathlon. And I want to thank all of the local law enforcement that were out there keeping the athletes, the spectators, and all of our volunteers safe. And I especially wanted to highlight the volunteers. Multiple, multiple student groups throughout the county, um, athletic groups, showed up to volunteer and without them this these kind of events could not take place and happen 
and subsequent to that, over 25 different schools within the county, as well as student athletic groups, will be receiving financial contributions for that volunteerism. So I really want to um, highlight that, recognize, thank the student groups. I know getting up that early in the morning on a Sunday is horrific, um, and just acknowledge them. And if any of our um, coaches and athlete groups aren't connected with that, I highly encourage you to get connected with that before this um, next year, because as of Monday, they're already planning for the next year. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Dodge Jr. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here this evening. Uh, I just wanted to briefly say that um, I live close to Minnie White, and I just wanted to say thank you to the gardening program that we have at Minnie White. I can't remember, I always forget the name. The Life Lab. The Life Lab. Um, when I have time to pass by, I always see all the young children, the kindergartners, the first graders, learning how to garden, how to be out in the garden, and um, it, it, it's a great program for young children. Uh, I just also wanted to say thank you to everybody at Watson High, the classified workers, the administrators, you know, the SRO, uh, the teachers, you know, I, I know Watsonville High School's full and I know everybody's trying to do their best to make sure that they're safe. And, um, I, you know, I, I just kind of to, to, to touch on, you know, just thank, thank you to the people who, you know, pick strawberries, who pick the berries, and even the apples, you know. I, you know, I didn't know how hard it was, you know, you think about picking apples, like, yeah, well, you know, but, you know, it's, it, it, it's hard work and I just wanted to thank the people that put all these vegetables and fruits in boxes for us because it, it, it's tough work. And um, I was able to attend um, the Watsonville High School homecoming. You know, Watsonville didn't do too well, but I just wanted to shout out the parents who work the snack bar. You know, it, it takes volunteer parents to, you know, they're not getting paid to serve food, you know, to, to make hot chocolate and food for everybody. So I just wanted to say thank you to the parents who volunteer at our snack bar at Watsonville High. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge tonight uh, a donation from Isabel and Emre for, um, what is their last name? Sorry. I'm sorry. Excuse me. There's no last name, or is that her last name? Um, I don't know. I don't okay, we'll get back to that. <laughs> um, I'm just going to move on from... Um, acknowledging donations now. We'll do it a little bit later when we go to consent agenda. Um, I have attended hours of meetings for Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance, and we finally have um, a new executive director, which I don't think the press releases have gone out, so I'm not going to announce tonight, but I'm happy to say that we do have a new executive in place there, so that's great news. Uh, we also had a meeting of the school board association and capital advisors put on a presentation which was um, taped about budget um, and I'll be sending that out as soon as I get it from Roger who's the chair. So I just want to let everyone else know. Turn sir. Oh, how do you say Isabel turn sir from LC Stema. Can you spell that for me? Yeah. Turnser. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now I'll acknowledge a donation, special donation for the Lagasse Culinary Teaching and um, kit and Garden um, from Isabel Tunser and Emre Tunser for $2,500. We thank them very graciously for that um, very generous donation. Also acknowledging a book donation from author Karen Look, uh, valued at $400. Thank you, Karen. And next up, we'll have um, our favorite part of the night, our high school student board re board representatives report. And tonight, we have three schools with us, New School, Renaissance, and PV High. So is New School ready to come to the podium? Um, in just a second, um, just to to I can start with, uh, oh yeah. Do you want me to start with a different? Okay, how about Renaissance? Is Renaissance ready? Thanks for being here tonight. Go ahead and introduce yourself and um, yeah, perfect, raise that. Okay, my name is Okay, um, I'd like to thank PVUSD for get us getting started on the field. We also appreciate the new pavement. 
Um, I'd like to thank you all for giving students the opportunity to go back to their original comprehensive high school after completing the needed credits. I'd like to thank you for hiring a friendly PE teacher who does a great job and giving me the opportunity to be here is much appreciated. <clears throat> Field trips are back, which students enjoy. They've already gone to the Museum of Art Industry, and we appreciate how the school murals we have on campus is protected. <clears throat> we enjoy the principal of our school, Miss Young, because she's very hands-on with the students and she knows what's going on. And our security guard, Rob, Rob's one of the best security guards I've ever met, hands down. He, uh, he, under he understands us, our age gap, and he's easy to talk to while also making us feel safe at Renaissance without the addition of an SRO. Um, students are excited on the return of volleyball. We've already run two games, which creates a positive attitude on campus. The small classes at Renaissance High help you focus a lot more and helps you better understand the concept of the class. Student leadership is on point and organized and the credit opportunities that Renaissance offers is great, but we still need a little more. With all the positives, there are still a few things that we could use at school. <clears throat> Some of the ideas for fundraisers are a snack shack and selling t-shirts and sweatshirts to raise money for school funding of field trips and events. Students respectfully request a language other than English teacher and an accredited after school program that offers transportation that would help students out who would need extra credits. And for the students who have after school jobs, getting out at two is inconvenient. Having advisory at the end of the day would make it easier for students who work to make it on their job on time like a lot easier. Once the field is complete, having a dedicated instructor for sports such as soccer would keep kids motivated to come to school. And on September 16th, we took the time to celebrate the culture of Mexican heritage. We had, a great, we had great food and having a fixed speaker would make future events much better. With all that being said, I'd like to once again thank PVUSD for allowing me to speak here tonight. And I'd like to thank my school renaissance for electing me as president. Next up is Pajaro Valley High School. Sorry about that. And that, sorry, let me just say one more thing. Can you turn off the microphone for a second so we don't get feedback? Thank you. That was a great presentation. You did a great job. Thanks for coming tonight. Okay, is this PV High? You can move the microphone down to your mouth and then press that button again to turn it on and then tell us who you are. Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez, President De Serpa, and board members. My name is Estefania, and I'm the senior class president for Pajaro Valley High School, and I'll be reporting for you guys tonight. For the last two years, PV students have come up with the theme for the year. Last year, beginning our first year back from COVID, our theme was No Place Like Home. We were so excited to be back on campus with our teachers, friends, and fellow Grizzlies. We wanted to make sure that our students knew that PV Nation was a welcoming place that would, everyone could call home. This year, our theme is family is the heart of PV Nation. We are pushing our ASB to create even more events that are inclusive and available to all the students. We want, th we want to make sure that all our Grizzlies feel like they are a part of our family and that we're here for them. Thank you. Oh. Activities and events. We started off the year with our annual freshman orientation with our amazing Grizzly crew. We welcomed the class of 2026 with a rally, team building activities, a school tour, and a chance to meet some of our key players at school. Our Grizzly crew is an important part of the beginning of the year in welcoming the incoming freshmen. Grizzly crew is made up of the most diverse group of students on campus. We want to make sure that the freshmen have someone they can relate to and bond with before school starts. We understand that coming to a new school can be scary and we want to make sure that they feel as welcomed as possible. The first day of school, our Grizzly crew was in full force, helping our new students find their classes, solve any problems they may have, and most importantly, be a friendly face to welcome them on their first day of high school. 
During lunch, we also had some noontime fun with the cornhole tournament, Jenga, Connect Four, and of course, music. Our Grizzly crew also walked around campus to make sure that there were no students sitting by themselves. Again, we wanted to make sure that everyone felt like they were part of the PB Nation family. The next week, we had our first spirit week. To make the spirit days easy and not crazy like most are, we did shoes, for example, Crocs and Slides or Vans and Converse. We ended the week with Grizzly Pride Friday and an all-school rally. The first part of school has been full of spirit, sp spirit and Grizzly Pride. ASB is back to work this month to make sure that the, the October is full of fun and excitement for all of our students and staff. Athletics, <laughs> football. Our football team is full of pride and we are working hard on our new field. We started the league with the win against SLV 26 to zero. Our team has also started the tradition of the turnover chain. During the game, we celebrate our defensive players with the turnover chain. The chain is earned by an amazing defense play, forced fumble or interception. It's an award our players strive to obtain every time they take the field and our fans love to see them awarded. We have also started our theme games where our student section, band, and cheer love to participate. This last game, we had our tropical game where everyone wore Hawaiian shirts and lies. Our student section and cheer played games during halftime with floats. It was a lot of fun. And just a reminder, you can't be six to zero unless you are two to zero. So make sure to come support our Grizzlies versus Gonzalez on Saturday, October 8th, and make sure to wear pink for our next theme football game. Uh, volleyball. This year, our volleyball team started the year off with three teams. While our freshman team doesn't get to play as many games as JV and varsity due to the lack of freshman, freshman team, they are working hard, learning lots, and having an amazing time. JV and varsity are working hard and are getting ready for league. We have a newer coach and enjoy her knowledge of the game. Tennis. Our tennis team is coming in hot with a 2-0 record in league. They have a very good chance of winning another championship. It must be that new flooring they put down at the end of the last year. Academics. This year, this year one of the new classes added is fifth and sixth period sports. This is an amazing growth for our athletic program and will help build our program and strengthen our players. During this class, the teams have fun by competing with each other with strength and speed. In addition, PVHS is also offering an academic lab where students who need credit recovery during the day are able to do so. Flor Florico is also a new class at PV. We have, also, we have always had a strong Flor Florico club and now our students are able to take it during school hours for PE. This week, we will be laying down the dance floor and the classroom so they can better prepare for their first performance in October. This year, we also welcome 20 new teachers to our PV Nation family. We welcome them to the nation with some amazing goodie bags and sway to start off the year. We love the new energy they bring into the campus. Our veteran teachers are still having fun and pushing us to do better. Some of our favorite projects we have done so far is to build a rocket and see if it would launch. Last, we just had our back to school night on Thursday, September 22nd, where we welcomed over 300 families to campus. We started the night with a welcome from our principal and counselors. Parents are welcome to meet some of the clubs we have on campus and participate in some of the fun activities with them. We had a food sale fundraiser event. Once they were done with the clubs, the families went into the gym to meet our teachers and see what students are doing in class. It is always amazing it is always an amazing night to bring our family to meet our school families together. 
upcoming events. October is a full month of fun, focusing on our college and career and taking the Youth Truth Survey. We start off with celebrating our National Coming Out Day on October 11th. Our staff and students get a chance to walk through our amazing rainbow door as allies to the LGBTQ plus community, students and staff. On October 12th, we will honor our Hispanic heritage with a Raza Day event on campus and students will be taking the PSAT. The following week, we will be hosting our annual Homecoming Week with the Spirit Week, noontime games, activities, and our first dance of the year. The last week of October, we have many activities for our college and career week and our college and career fair. Thank you. Thank you, that was great. And uh, next up, we have New School. Okay, good evening, President De Serpa, Superintendent Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees. Hello, my name is Laxman. And Miguel. And we come from New School. Our motto is never give up. At New School, we also lift up. Miguel and I today were honored as Student of the Month by Wantsville Rotary. Thank you. <laughs> Some events we went to were Shakespeare at Santa Cruz and we've enjoyed this opportunity. New School is exploring many career options. Our, our first trip was to El Pajaro CDC Commercial Kitchen. Volleyball season has started at New School. New School has three competitive teams and so far we are doing great. It has built a lot of friendships and trust. I think the slide needs to go forward. Thank you. Okay. There. On Friday mornings, we ha we have music class with El Sistema, which we enjoy. On Fridays, we take a trip to Science Workshop, where we get to learn many things, build a lot of things, and have fun. On Friday mornings, we also have a dance club and we do art. We've also taken a trip to Pajaro Valley Art and work with them Fridays afternoons. Our school provides us with many opportunities for community service, such as coastal cleanup at the Santa Cruz Fair, where I did some hours there, and I took a picture of the little girl there holding bugs. <laughs> So far into the school year, we started our garden projects. Do you want to say some garden projects? What's this? Uh, some projects we've done so far are like beds. So far, we planted peas, a wa watermelon, uh, squash, carrots, and onions.
Thank you. Thank you, Renaissance. That was awesome. New school. Oh, I'm sorry, New School. What am I talking about? Everyone was awesome tonight. Okay. News and welcome to the principal, Mrs. Gralti. We're happy to see you in the boardroom. So next up is the approval of the agenda, item 4.1. Looking for a I'd motion. I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda with um, an amendment moving items 11, 12, and 14 before 10.1. Uh, I hear no seconds, so I think that motion will fail. Uh, I'll second. Oh, you'll second, okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? I'm just, sorry. I guess for clarification, we're just moving in all the action uh, voting items before the report and discussion. So items 11, 12, 11 is consent agenda, 12 is deferred consent, and 14 is reporting out of closed session. So it's just to move those before the report and discussion, that's all. Just for clarification, I think, yeah, I think it seemed okay. like there was some confusion. And I, I think it's maybe okay. still. I'm gonna ask actually for a roll call vote because I couldn't tell who was in favor. Um, confused. It's, yeah, it's a little bit confusing. So, Eva, if you could roll call, please. Trustee Soto, your vote? Aye. Trustee Acosta, your vote? Aye. Trustee Shocker, your vote? Aye. Trustee Dodge, your vote? Aye. Trustee Holm, your vote? Aye. Trustee Orozco, your vote? Aye. And President DeSerpa, your vote? Aye, thank you. Next is item 5.1, the approval of September 14th board meeting, board meeting minutes. I move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstaining? Abstain. Thank you. Motion carries six, um, what is it, six? We're all, we're all favor. Right, okay. but we six had an abstain. Six zero one. Thank you, 601. Next up, we have a public hearing, item 6.1. This is the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers, or PVFT, Sunshine Proposal to Pajaro Valley Unified School District for Collective Bargaining Agreement Negotiations 2022-2025 school year. Thank you, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So as part of the RADA Act, um, whenever the district and bargaining units are gonna enter into negotiations, it needs to be presented at a public meeting in order for the public to provide comment. Excuse me, comment if they wish. So this is just part of the process. PVFT is bringing forward their sunshine proposal. We will be um, negotiating a full contract. So that's why it's from 22 to 25. So it's for three years. Um, and so this is the, the public, um, forum for that and so I'm just putting the public on notice that we'll be entering into negotiations and the action item will be coming later in the agenda. Great, thank you for that. Um, so before we move on to board comments or questions, we do have a speaker tonight. We have Brandon Denise. No. Um, greetings and thank you to the board for allowing me to speak tonight. Uh, here we are again at another negotiation cycle, um, which means we have the opportunity to come together and to lift up our students. It seems like public education has never been on such untenuous ground. And instead of approaching these negotiations using the same failed tactics, we really need to be united and get started immediately. 
Um, I implore you to come to the table immediately and start getting to that work of lifting our students up and providing them with the opportunities that they deserve. This isn't teachers versus administrators. This should be all of us coming together to improve as much of this contract as we can. Um, I'm not sure how often you read the contract, but it's a mess and there's a lot that can be improved in that contract. We lose teachers year after year, not just because of wages, but because teachers get burned out working in dilapidating buildings while facing an unprecedented staffing crisis and having to make up for the excuses and the failings of this district. Um, let's stop the tradition of this district negotiating with the PVFT from a position of excuses and we ask you to negotiate in good faith um, so that we can come together and really do justice by our students and improve as much of this contract as we can. Thank you. Okay, that's the only public comment. Are there any uh, discussion or questions from the board? Okay, seeing none, we'll close this public hearing. Thank you. Is there anything else, Allison? No, I'm just going to turn off the microphone. Okay, thank you. I know it's a lot of feedback tonight. Okay, I'll close this public hearing. Thank you. Uh, next up is item 7.1, a visitor non-agenda items. The time for public comment and two minutes each. Um, so we do have two speakers under this item. Chris Webb followed by Antonio Rivas. Good evening. Um, I wanna thank Superintendent Assistant Soup, uh, Lisa Garia, for inviting Renaissance to be here. I feel like just that right there is is a, a hopeful sign for me. Like I feel like we're more noticed, and and I'm I'm thank the the students for coming and presenting because I know that can be tough. Um, also, I'm not sure who to credit for this, but um, it, whether it's individual Tosas or our assistant superintendent of secondary or or who, but I just want to report report feeling more supported this year from the DO, um, from different curriculum and like um, English language development uh, personnel who've reached out and have been receptive the other, the other way. And there's been other figures too, so I, I just appreciate that. And I also wanted to share um, a, a reflection from the first couple weeks of school. Um, I had to use a personal day to, for childcare. And during that same time period, I had students who were trying to figure out how are they gonna meet their community service hours, and then, you, as you all know, you're trying to figure out how are you gonna fill subbing positions, and, and you might be able to figure out how our, our interests converge in a way that could have helped everybody. Especially for, 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 I say this as a person who has handled with their kid while teaching and being with their personal kids, and whose students have handled when my kids are there. So I, there is a way for us to all work together in a way that helps everybody. Community service, I get the child care I need from, my, from myself. You guys get uh, less, one less sub that you need. And I, it's an overall positive experience for everyone. Um, one last thing, I would just like one to say, we have those reverse osmosis drinking fountains. We could maybe use some re some reusable water bottles. I see a lot of plastic bottles flying around. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. He's coming. Hmm. Uh, good evening, members of the school board, superintendent, administration. My name is Antonio Rivas, and, and the reason I'm coming before you is I just wanted to really thank you uh, for having the, um, the Senior Council Foster Grandparent Volunteer Program, which is a, is a great program and which they can be able to help the kids in the elementary level and also in the middle school. So it, at no cost of you, so it's important that um, you be aware of it, of the program, and I just wanted to really thank you for uh, for having the MOU that you have uh, drafted 
and um, and hopefully we'll continue on on uh, to having this program for our senior program helping the, the kids that really need some help one on one in, in the schools. So I thank you, and uh, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Mr. Rivas. We're checking. Thank you. Sorry, out of order here. I apologize. Okay, we have Donna Lefevre followed by uh, Veronica Gallagher. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Donna Lefevre. I'm a math teacher at Watsonville High School. Um, just speaking again, uh, we still are in need of subs, so that's still a thing. Um, and then I just also wanted to bring up the fact that uh, there was a question. Uh, we get emails from Dr. Rodriguez like updating on um, all the things going on and, and responding to some questions. And there was a question about the shortage of substitutes and what we can do about that. And the response was that um, we actively recruit substitutes via EdJoin. Um, and then to improve our recruiting efforts, we have maintained our $240 daily rate for long-term rate and have solidified the hourly rate for substitutes who need to attend events and activities. And it goes on from there. But um, my point is that um, the place where teachers are having to step in is for the day-to-day. -day. And the way that you represented that, it makes it sound like um, substitutes are being, being paid $240 a day when actually on EdJoin, the day-to-day -day salary is 140 um, I had a friend working in the LA Unified District um, six years ago, was making $236 a day as a day-to-day -day sub. Um, it was at a time when the district was in need of teachers and there was a sub shortage and so they had a high salary. Um, that needs to happen here. We need to have subs. We need to know that there are people that are qualified and ready to step into our classroom so that we're not so panicked to take our sick day when we actually need it. Um, it's happening right now that there's teachers that are getting to that point of the year where they're just really exhausted or they're dealing with family issues and people are stepping up to support them and because we don't have that pool of substitutes because we're trying to draw from um, a pool of applicants for $140 a day, I mean, you're just not gonna have that many people coming to you. So um, we really need to think about that. Hopefully there's someone speaking for the substitutes today in that organization, um, because that's something that really we need to see a change in. Thank you. My name is Veronica Gallagher. I work at H.A. Hyde Elementary School. You need to pay substitutes twice as much for their valuable work. They need a degree to substitute. My niece makes $20 an hour working at a sporting goods store. No experience at all, $20 an hour. You're paying substitutes that much for and you need a degree, you need to be in charge of 25 to 35, and even more in high school. And it, it's less than $20 an hour when you get to high school because the day is longer. You wonder why you can't get subs in high school. It's a shame. You have to pay substitutes twice as much for their valuable work. Teachers need to know that they are, there are substitutes available when they are sick or when the, we have family emergencies. Teachers do not take advantage of sick days. It takes hours to make sub plans. We don't want to disrupt our classes and all the routines we put in place. I personally have over 46 days after my 26 years as, as a teacher. Um, I don't take days off. I have been fortunate to be fairly healthy throughout my 26 year career, but I have an elderly mom who may need help. I take care of my brother who is a vet of Desert Storm. He has PTSD. I need to take care of him. Teachers have family obligations and many various issues. We need to know that substitutes are available when we have to be absent. Okay, so where can we get the money to pay for substitutes a fair living wage? First of all, cut the number of salaries, the number and the salaries of administrators in our district. Our union used to say chop from the top. 
the superintendent of PVSD should not be making the same salary as the vice president of the United States of America. Assistant superintendent should not be making the same as the governor of California and Thank you. US senators. Thank you. Another way to save money is to stop paying for excessive testing and for excessive curriculum. Thank Let you me for just your end with a quote from Dolores Huerta. I think we're done. I yeah, think done. organized labor is a necessary Thank part of democracy. Organized labor is the only way to have a fair distribution of wealth. Please look at that quote from Dolores Huerta. So those are the four speakers for that item. Thank you. Next up, we have employee organization comments, and we'll start with 8.1 PVFT. Good evening, board. President Kim, Kim DeSerpa and <clears throat> Dr. Rodriguez. Sorry, it's been a tough two weeks of serious asthma. Um, so thank you to our teachers, our educators who are here representing um, and speaking their truth. Again, this is what I referenced to, this is how we started last time. <clears throat> and you can hear that the impacts of vacancies are still, um, are still causing daily strain on our educators. Our new teachers, our first year teachers, make a daily rate of $275. So you can imagine the, um, the strain on our new teachers who are um, in our classrooms with our students not wanting to lose a day to writing subplans so that they can be out to address their own health or um, if there is suddenly a need to take a personal necessity day. Personal necessity days, we use those to care for our family um, because those are the days we take when it's not our own personal health being affected. <clears throat> so a daily rate for a long-term sub of $240 a day, while that might be um, a high rate for this area, it's the difference between the two um, should cause some pause. Uh, because we do really need many new teachers in our district. Uh, so please keep that in mind when we discuss salaries. <clears throat> I'll come back up and speak to our sunshine um, when it's that time on the, on the agenda. One of the items on um, the consent agenda uh, is a contract with the Community Schools Learning Exchange. Um, and the community schools, so we, we are grateful that the district heard um, our request on investigating and looking and applying for a planning grant to implement community schools in our area because community schools do take many of the pieces we, we have right now that are, that are functioning in silos pretty much and creating something more cohesive. And the two years of planning allow us to really discuss how something like that could be rolled out in our, in our schools as opposed to just accepting money and then putting it on the, on the shoulders of the people at the school site to come up with something. This, um, so we are in agreement to um, the Community Schools Learning Exchange to be one of our, um, uh, to mediate, to help guide us through this process and planning. <clears throat> Thank you, I have to, I'm gonna end my, my talking time, but um, I will come back to speak to our sunshine, uh, and well, you'll see me again in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Nellie. Um, next up, we have item 8.2, CSEA, or California School Employees Association. Do you have any representatives here tonight speaking on behalf of CSEA? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to item 8.3. Uh, this is PAVAM, or Pajaro Valley Association of Managers.
Good evening. Good evening. Board President Deserpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. I'm Consuelo Mason. I'm the proud principal of Bajaro Valley High School, and I have the honor tonight to share with you how our comprehensive high schools are doing. So Aptos High School wants to congratulate their senior, Chase Jakes Mays, who has been awarded the letter of commendation for outstanding performance on the preliminary SAT. Aptos High School staff is conducting a school-wide book study on Sarita Hammond's culturally responsive teaching and the brain. They are also in collaboration on equitable grading with the Santa Cruz County Office of Education. Aptos High School Spring 2022 AP scores are in and their students have a 73.7 passing rate on their advanced placement exams. Pajaro Valley High School. Congratulations to our two seniors, Carla Leva, who you know from the Farm to Cafeteria, and Jenny Reyes, who have earned National Recognition Programs Awards because of their academic achievement in school and outstanding performance on their PSAT. Congratulations, we're proud of them. Our staff is effectively using their collaborative time during our restructured Wednesdays to further their teaching practice. We are also in collaboration with UCSC uh, to learn on a collaborative call, learn how, to, how English works to further their understanding of the ELD and California content standards to meet the needs of our second language learners. Our AP scores are also out and we want to congratulate our students for having an overall performance increase in all the content areas, but we're extremely proud of our Spanish language exam passing rate at 100%. So congratulations, Grizzlies. Watsonville High. Uh, they concluded a busy week of a fun-filled homecoming activities. They had their annual parade, um, from the old fire station all the way through the plaza and finalizing, of course, in that famous wildcat way on their cafeteria area. They had floats and they had their homecoming dance that um, where uh, 570 students attended. The dance included Vanda, DJ, and tacos. The students had a blast dancing to their favorite songs in a photo booth. Our, across our three campuses, our wellness teams are meeting consistently. Um, and they do take, um, they are uh, meeting weekly. Uh, and again, here is where we do those supports that are needed for our students who are struggling. Uh, we're also extremely proud of our partners, community partners. We have uh, PVPSA and Monarch Services working with us uh, consistently and we're so happy to have them. Saturday schools are also taking place where we have dedicated teachers and students who are coming on Saturdays to do enrichment as well as recover some of those missed periods that we know they tend to do here and there or their tardies. Uh, honor rolls also will be happening in the next two weeks. Thank you. Good evening. On behalf of the alternative ed schools, I'd like to report on Visual um, Virtual Academy. Their retention rate is 88% of all their students are there for two to three years, and high participation rate in their daily synchronous lear learning and live inter interaction sessions. Families are very excited for the and volunteering for some in-person activities. At PCCS, um, they have a lot of ninth and 10th graders, which is good for student retention, and they're enjoying back to school and hybrid classes. They have a lot of interesting field trips planned for this year, and their participation and governing council is increasing. <clears throat> Two of their teachers started a bird watching class with the high school students, and they bring the younger students along for that, and it's really helping to build a sense of community across everything. Um, at DTI, um, unfortunately, new school lost to them last week, but uh, it is the end of, in volleyball, it is their end of the progress report one, um, and it brought spirit week, academic interviews, and lots of fun on the field with volleyball. And you heard from Renaissance earlier, and at new school, we are, um, we are underway with um, exploring new career options for our students, so we have a whole series of career um, exploration, as you have seen. I've asked um, 
Jennifer Shacker to come speak on behalf of what she does for the community. And I'll be reaching out to many of you um, for your input. We've had speakers from Watsonville Community Hospital, from um, uh, different, um, the Culinary Kitchen, the DTI, um, not DTI, um, anyway, a bunch of different places that we are reaching out to to improve our students' access to what is in the Watsonville community and what they can do when they graduate from high school. Any questions? Thank you. Next up, we have item 8.4. Anyone here from Communication Workers of America, CWA, representing uh, substitutes? Okay, let's move on to action items. Uh, action, action item 9.1. This is a Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers Sunshine proposal to Pajaro Valley Unified School District for collective bargaining agreement for the years 22 through 25. And this report is presented by Allison Mazawa. Yes. Thank you, President Serpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. I'm actually going to invite the president of PBFT up to discuss their Sunshine proposal. Mm -hmm. All right. Good evening. I'm back. <clears throat> So we're just opening the entire contract. I'm just kidding. Um, quite a few of the articles. Um, some uh, when we come back to to open up our our contract during a master contract cycle, it is to either improve on the language as we every year the things that we encounter we might discover hmm here is where there is a hiccup with how language has been negotiated in the past or here is how we need to update due to modernizing education so um we have you know minor things like in our general definitions but of course the big the big ones are going to be workload um and <laughs> and uh class size and of course uh wage we are, that's our salary when we talk about total compensation. Uh, workload is, it's for the past couple of years as we've come back in person, has been um, very overwhelming. Um, we understand that the um, understaffing then, uh, it, it puts it puts all that work out to that might, that still needs to get done and who's doing it. Um, but we, in our agreements, our contract sets parameters because we want to make sure that the people who are working with the students in the classroom, who are guiding them through their education, are able to come to work every day feeling refreshed and feeling 100% um, prepared or at their absolute best to do that. So, um, you know, we're we, this year we hear issues with um, added work, just added duties. So suddenly there's new adjunct duties. Well, there needs, what's coming off? Or there are programs that were never brought through curriculum council, but suddenly teachers find themselves at being asked to implement something new and that had not been, um, you know, there wasn't, where's, where, what's the item that's gonna come off? Of, of our teachers, of our educators' plates, so that they can accommodate these new asks. So those are the types of conversations we have when we discuss workload, and then they might affect other um, areas in our contract. Um, with the um, with the concern or the issue of enrollment, where we have um, in some grades declining enrollment um, or um, <laughs> our, and where we need teachers, um, so vacancies. So th how we um, address reassignments and transfers is also another area that has really impacted teachers the last couple of years. And so there's definitely some language that needs to be um, agreed to that helps us all work together in having a clear process, um, it being, if we're you know equitable and fair, uh, and when we are looking at um, having somebody make that scary move to a new position um, or who wants to move to a new position, but then there's other, um, there are barriers within the contract language that prevent them from just doing that right away. So um, thank you. And uh, again, so this is, 
you all will hear us come up and speak and um, to this as, as we move forward. We are looking to forward to the district um, coming back as soon as they can so that they can sunshine <laughs> what they are hoping to, um, to open up on, on our contract so that we can begin meeting and um, working on this in earnest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any speakers? Uh, we don't have speakers. Are there um, any comments or questions from the board on this item? No, okay, thank you. Oh, we, have, we need action, so I'm looking for a motion to approve. Make a motion to approve. I'll, I'll second. second. Okay, I think Maria did the second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries 7-0, thank you. Um, next up is item 9.2, resolution 22-2308, instructional material sufficiency. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Board Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. At uh, the last board meeting, we held a public um, hearing to present the proposed resolution for instructional material sufficiency. Uh, tonight, I'm asking for approval, acknowledging that all students have sufficient textbooks and or instructional materials or the materials have been ordered. This is based on school visits as well as assurances from the principals. Thank you. We have no speakers to this item. Any questions or comments from the board? Looking for a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. First and second, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank Anyone you. Anyone opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Item 9.3, a resolution 22-2309 um, for October uh, is RETS Awareness Month. And this is presented by our um, SELPA Director, Heather Gorman. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees. I'm here tonight to present a resolution for October to be RETS Awareness Month. RETS Syndrome Awareness Month is an annual designation observed in October. Rett syndrome is a very rare, non-inherited genetic disorder that occurs almost exclusively in girls. It generally sets in between six and 18 months of age. This disorder only affects about one in every 10,000 girls worldwide. Since I have been in the school district, I have known two girls with Rett syndrome in PBUSD. One of them happened to be in my special day group too many years ago for me to mention. One of them, um, the other girl was in our post-secondary program. Sadly, she passed away recently at the age. This resolution is for all of the girls with Rhett, the two that I have, and for their families and friends. I'll read a bit from the resolution. Whereas Rhett syndrome is a rare postnatal genetic neuro, neuro, oh, I knew I was gonna stumble over these words, sorry. Neurological disorder that occurs almost exclusively in and rarely males, whereas their diagnosis of Rett syndrome requires maximum assistance with daily living activities for their entire lives, and whereas we must continue our efforts in bringing awareness to the medical community, researchers, therapists, teachers, caregivers, and the general public as well. We must have funding available for researchers who are dedicated to finding a cure for Rett syndrome. I'm asking for the support of the PVUS due PVUSD board to recognize October as Rhett Awareness Month, and in this shared recognition, we hope to see progress that will continue until the world is with the world. Thank you, Heather. Do we have any speakers? Reval? We also brought um, pictures of one of our students, and they're in the back there. Without the uh, blue ribbons for you. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, and members of the board for acknowledging Rhett Syndrome Awareness Month. We're here to speak specifically about Madeline. Madeline was a Rhett warrior. Despite the severity of her disability, she was a strong young woman with a personality you couldn't help but love. She retained her ability to walk and communicated with her body, a few words, and a speech generating device, which she controlled with her eyes. Madeline's smile and laughter was contagious, and she had deep and meaningful connections with peers and staff. 
Madeline enjoyed books and music and was especially fond of the movie Frozen. Madeline passed away unexpectedly at the age of 19, just a month shy of the, her 20th birthday, October 23rd. She's been a part of our PVOSD community since the age of two. She graduated Aptos High School in 2021 and was most recently enrolled in our post-secondary program at the Youth Center. Those of us who knew Madeline are better for it. She touched the lives of countless PVUSD staff. And Thank you. Any comments from our board? In home? I just, I just wanted to give you this. Many conversations of you know, just like I, but she was Evelyn was a bright star. Her mom, your your warrior person herself, um, and we have an opportunity. Honor, not just about the individual, those individuals. Honor that 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 person they're part of. We're dealing with that, that in the communities. Yeah, Um, so, like Ken, I worked in the NICU with my husband, with, and we knew Madeline. In fact, Madeline was inspiration for the playground that I built at Valencia, the boundless playground for kids who were in wheelchairs who couldn't get put in place. We built a playground in the whole region um, for kids in wheelchairs and kids with other disorders, and I felt proud of the work. And, um, and Madeline was the inspiration in our school. So um, thank you for bringing it. You want to? Item 9.4, stop resolution 12. 2011, recognizing October 19, the week. Yes, thank you, President DeServa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Before you tonight is the resolution to uh, adopt the week of the school administrator, which is October 9th through the 15th, 2022. Most school administrators begin their careers as teachers, and the average administrator has served more than a decade. Superintendents tend to serve more than 20 years. Um, in education, such experience is beneficial in their work to effectively lead public education and improve student achievement. School leaders depend on a network of support from school communities um, and resources to promote ongoing student achievement and school success. Research shows that great schools are led by great principals and great districts are led by great students. So this resolution is before you tonight, so I recognize school administrators. Do we have any speakers? Comment. Thank you very much for those of you who are in the room who are thinking about um, moving up into administration. I really encourage. Do the leadership. It's a calling. Hi. Yeah. 
item 9.5 resolution 2012 clean air yeah, so we have, as you heard in the board trustee comments, we have a very active green team, district-wide green team, um, and we also have very active board members that are part of that. So um, Trustee Shocker has been working with this organization over the last several months and ensuring that we're going to be ready for our clean air day. And so along with our green team representatives, um, we're moving this forward. Um, Clean Air Day will be on October 5th, so that is next. Um, and many people within Santa Cruz County are very health conscious, very um, ecologically um, conscious. Um, so we want to make sure that we are showing that we too are putting as much emphasis as we can. I just want to mention some of the statistics that are actually on the Clean Day um, website is that pretty um, astounding, really. So, seven out of ten of the most ozone populated cities are actually found within California. Um, so, we're thinking about nationally. We find seven out of the ten of them are actually right here. I remember when I was a child, um, we would have days off school for poor air. If I lived in Southern California, we would they would literally send us home. Um, because the air quality was, the smog was just so bad. Um, and there are 1 million annual absences in California related to air pollution itself, right? Um, so when we think about people that have rose respiratory, um, and if you're a Californian, you're four times more likely to experience some of those air pollution problems. So for that alone, um, we really want to um, encourage people to um, think um, as much as they can before they get in a vehicle. So if they can walk and ride a bike, um, please do so, especially if you can on um, on that clean on Clean Air Day on October fifth. If you can um, try to do as much as you can, that is good for the environment, um, such as not idling in cars, walking, um, biking, and um, we will be sending out different. Um, different activities to our staff um, this following week, um, and specifically on the day of October 5th in record day. And so I asked for board approval of um, Clean Air Day on um, Wednesday. Are there any Uh, since I didn't see the resolves so clearly, I, I maybe have a couple, some meat you can add. So first, I want to thank you for having this. And for the um, item 9.915, the bus one, I like that. Um, I think these are both great. Um, Renaissance, we have a rail right in front of us. And like it's like a dream that one day I'll maybe be able to take that in. But I think a more short-term, more realistic thing might be like one day, maybe my students can take the train to Renaissance. If there's a way we can um, do that, I think that'd be great. Um, another thing, kind of thinking about the last meeting where um, we had the, the superintendent item, the evaluation, um, I know like part of the compensation is for a vehicle. I feel like PVUSD, green team, should uh, consider making it so that, that that allowance can only be applied to green vehicles. And, and I, just so you know, like in, in my econ class, when, when these kind of issues come up and, I, and we're talking about incentives and like, how can we do things for the school? And, and I ask students what they want and they'll say to me, oh, we want gas cards. Not so much this year, less people are driving, but they used to say that more. Um, and I would always say, no, I don't want that for you. I'm not gonna push that. And I would say, because I don't wanna make it cheaper for you to pollute. So I kind of feel the same way for professionals as I do for students that that's not really what I would want my tax dollars to go for I'm okay with an allowance but I feel like we we could maybe do better on that and then just you know before the body resolves in that way you could possibly just take an you know executive decision and trade in trade in for a greener vehicle so I just want to throw that out there thank you
So I'm looking. Right, I need a I'd like to make a motion. Well, I'm sorry, there's we comments. We can't hear you over the beep. <laughs> yeah. What? Christy Holm, what's your comment? Um, I just wanted to say, you know, it's like I, I recently listened to a podcast about an inverse correlation between pollution levels, right? As trustees, you know, I know that hear comments that we really need to on with reality we find that all of the resolution are one right for our Part of the it will be in my Friday message. Hi. Hi. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, Herlindo and I are here to present to the board a uh, fencing evaluation that was done along with the request for some funding to put towards fencing at numerous um, of our sites. What we ended up doing, and really I won't take the credit, was Herlindo and his team, but um, they actually got multiple fencing contractors to come out in a very short amount of time considering how many sites we actually looked at to come evaluate how much it would cost to add fencing to, as you can see, the sites listed up there. There are a couple of other sites we actually looked at. Um, Hall and Ohlone we did look at. We determined they actually had adequate fencing. We are still evaluating Landmark, and we have TV High that we're evaluating as well. Um, the intent was to look at any safety concerns that may be raised by those sites in terms of gaps in fencing, or if you look at Bradley, for example, they have four-foot fences, don't really prevent anything. Um, Radcliffe, for example, if you look at the markup, you might think they actually have fences there already. Theirs is actually for slats to put in those fencing because they're on a busy street. They've actually had individuals come up to those fences, try and reach through the fence. So for them, it's a little bit different, but all in all, for all sites, it's really just evaluating the safety of the site and then adding fences to those sites. One of the reasons for the large dollar amount is, unfortunately, not only do we have to add fences when we add those, but we also have to add doors and or gates, so to speak. In with those gates, we can't just do a typical gate that opens up and latches because in the event of a of a um, an event at a school site where students may need to exit that school site, I'll use Rio for example. Um, Trustee Holm and I walked that site, and we both asked when we saw fencing going around that entire site, "What if students need to exit through the back like they would because there's a threat in the front of the school?" So what that means is we have to add not only gates, but gates that can be opened from the inside, but not the outside, which of course end up being a little bit pricier. So. All of that has been taken into account in the evaluation. We also are looking at all of the front of schools, making sure that we don't typically use chain link fences at the front of the school, but use more of a black ornamental fence like you would see at Radcliffe, for example. Um, so all of that kind of increases the cost of some of these projects. All in all, we've evaluated it to be between eight to $900,000. We are looking at using our Measure L maintenance fund, so this won't actually be any funding from the general fund. It's not unrestricted, it's actually funding specifically for site upgrades and improvements. So fencing fits in that very well. The board will also see all of these projects come back to board as they get approved. Some of them will have to go out for bidding due to the size. Watsonville High, for example, is a much larger one because a lot of their fencing is already that black ornamental fencing. We are trying to stick with the same fencing at the site that it currently has. So that'll of course change the cost per site. But all of those will come to the board for approval separately. This is really just asking the board for approval to assign these funds. This does not in any way affect our fund balance. This is solely just to take our Measure L funds and assign them for something. So that way, as Herlindo and his team go out and do the work, we know there's funding available for all of these projects. Um, I know the board may ask, were there priorities when we looked at these? Which sites did we prioritize? Really, after looking, Herlindo and I determined that all sites need it. 
that's why we're not asking the board for a specific, you know, to prioritize certain sites, but really to just assign the total amount so that we can ensure all the sites. So, uh, Erlindo, so was it you that went out to Watsapa High? Good evening. Yes, it was me that went out to Watsapa And met up with a couple of contractors. It was me, myself, and Sergio. I met up with the contractor. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a great idea. You know, it, 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 keeps our, it keeps our campus safe, because I know towards the back, that's where we tend to have People trying to come on campus and a lot of, you know, right there on Elm and Maple, so I think that, that's a great idea. But I think it also allows us to be safe and allows our campus to be open. Watsapa High has always been an open campus, and I will support that. And uh, thank you for what you're doing at Radcliffe. I know, you know, when I went to volunteer to pick up trash for the, the kids during their lunch, and I know that was a big concern because Radcliffe hugged up against a certain port. And I know there's been issues where I guess a woman throws things, just kind of yells at the kids. You know, it's like a, a homeless woman. That, but yeah, the, it makes the, the parents, the students, and the teachers feel unsafe. So I think that's a great idea. So thank you. And Trustee Dodge, just to add to um, Watson High, we also walk, walk with PDS. So they actually looked at um, the security of that site to help give some advice on where we could potentially add fencing. As you know, that um, left side there down by those buildings opens directly into the street, and that's one of the main concerns for us. So I'm just clarifying. So you said down your Yeah, so PV High is a tough one because along with mm -hmm. uh, Aptos High, those campuses that are up those hills and just have so many entry points. So really what we're looking at is, is there a way to just potentially increase, improve some of the safety at that site. Um, I know that we've been, Herlindo and I have talked about it a bit, and we'll be checking with the principal there, Consuelo, as well, see if she has any thoughts on just areas where she's seen the most traffic or where we could potentially add a few fencing to store it up. We can absolutely do that. Okay. just want to be on this. Like I know I've been involved in a lot of the conversation you know, and the fire to P D and, and all of all the process. Right. A lot I appreciate a lot. Yeah, so this funding will go towards, again, the priority schools that we've put up there, but we'll bring back each item to the board, as well as an update of how much of that 900000 we've spent, so the board can continue to see that that 900000 that you're allocating is being spent. And landmark. Right. Just a quick question. Um, when are these RFPs uh, proposed to go out? So some of them, uh, we've already got quotes for all, all of the fencing that we did on um, all of these sites. Some of them came in around twenty to 30000 maybe an additional ten or fifteen for those gates. So those would actually be within our cut limit to be able to assign those based on the lowest vendor um, that proposes it. Some of them we've already seen would be estimated over 100000 so we'd be putting those out to bid. So as soon as the board approves this, we'll be working next week to start getting um, contractors out based on kind of our preliminary quote, seeing which ones we need to actually do a bid for and which ones we'll go back to the vendor who had the lowest quote, reach out, out to them and see if they can come do the work. This work won't interfere with school operations and during a normal schedule. This isn't something that has to wait for summertime? No, as far as I know, um, especially with, for example, the Rio Del Mar one, which I'm most familiar with, it's the back side of their field, so that'll be put in, can be put in during school. Awesome. Yeah. 
Um, so the eight hundred and nine hundred thousand that's that's done for listed but our so funding it's specific and each school site prepared the allocation out of their measure. So it's not okay. actually out of their measure L. We have a maintenance endowment fund as well as uh, along with a maintenance fund through Measure L, which is more district-wide projects that need to be done that was approved during Measure L. So we have money in that fund. So none of the sites will have to actually pay for any of the fencing. It'll come out all out of the district Measure L money that we have for me. So it's not going back to that. Okay, this is what we want to spend our Measure L, our L, that lump of. Correct. So no sites will be having to use coming. their fund. This is coming. Correct. So don't need to approve Correct. Of course. The maintenance endowment was ended in a. So it's actually a bit of a fallacy. So okay. the Measure L funding doesn't have to actually be spent by any time. There is a point at which the Measure L funding we, that we have remaining cannot gain more interest than the bonds themselves. So effectively, we can't be saying we're holding on to the money to get interest off it, even though the payout of the interest is less than what we're actually getting in interest. So there is no timeline for us to actually spend it. It's just to spend it. We have to show that we're making a reasonable effort to spend the funds. Even. Not for the endowments. But this money was set aside because of the state stopped giving us maintenance money. Side that used every year to maintenance in our correct. So we have two different maintenance pieces. One is the endowment of which we put about a million aside each year to actually put into our schools. Then, as to your point, we have the interest which we put aside for additional maintenance project. That's where this would come from. Is really that pot of money we have for all sites to make improvement. On before the measure L. I can bring it up to the um, oversight committee. It is within the uh, measure L documents and what we're supposed to spend it on. So it's nothing that would be um, really, I mean, again, they do have the oversight of it, but it's all within the pamphlet and what we went out for voters for. But I can absolutely let the oversight committee know. Okay. And then I had asked, asked about safety money that I thought was federal cover. Cool. Uvalde shooting, and do we know if there's that we get improve our So we haven't seen anything yet. I've been um, working with school services and following it closely. I actually just was um, up in um, Sacramento and saw John Gray. I didn't give a, get a chance to ask him about that, but typically when they give us updates on budget and give us updates on what's coming down, they let us know. I haven't heard anything about the safety money at this time, but I'll keep looking for it, and I always check my emails from school services to see what's coming up. We'll grab a bunch of that. We can more in hand. Safety, okay. Um, did we? I think. Hi. Hi. Anyone opposed? Thank yeah, you so much. Thank you. For policy. So much so, as is customary for when we are adding a board policy, then we have two readings. This is the second reading, and um, there has been some conversation since this posting um, about adding one. And so I know um, Board um, Chrissy Holm is going to. Um, to that request. The only other changes that happened is there is multiple spelling options of, of how, due to dialect, of how it is coded. And so you will note that there are a few that the, that was changed in slight spelling, and it, it was just um, dialect preference. Um, so we had community members reach out regarding the use of which 
um, dialect we were going to use, and so that is reflected in this as well. I will. Oh, yeah, so I had a, a uh, mention. So just honoring Swedish. One opposed? Nine point eight in committee. Thank you so much. So we have quite the powerhouse at, at the Green Team that um, really gained some notoriety not only throughout our community but throughout the and so because of that we've had various members that have come forward and asked part of our green. Um, so previously, um, we only allowed, when we were looking at our representation, um, we only allowed for two community members. We have since had various others that have requested. And so um, because we do feel that they would be a benefit, um, we currently have two additional community member organizations that have requested part of the green team. I did expand it five um, so that in case we have one additional that comes in we don't have to come back to the board in a pretty close order um, so this would everything else remains the same um, except for it would be increasing the number of community member organizations um, from two to five and so i request the board's proof that we can include these people within the within the organization and so um, that is the two members are um, one of them is Life Lab. So Life Lab has requested um, to be part of it. And another one is um, the um, County of Santa Cruz is asking to be part of that as well. Yeah, there. So. We're going to add another community member, or community member, you said? We're going to add two, Life Lab and the County of Santa Cruz, or Santa Cruz. I just thought, like, I thought you meant by people from the public, but. Yeah, um, community organization. Okay. Right. Was. But one will make that vacancy. So we frequently at Green Team, as we're doing additional initiatives, we have people ask part of it. So, for example, we've had some conversation with, um, for instance, Esperanza Farms, part of that. Um, and so, for instance, if they were wanting that, we would basically bring it to the committee and be able to have that um, wiggle room. So, I did it just because it has more and more we're having more community organizations that are very interested and want or want them to see. Thank you, Trustee Acosta, for helping me with that. Um, I think if we have a community member, can we get preference to make sure they live in the Pajaro Valley Unified School District area? I think um, the other two organizations that we have is um, we have Wetlands Watch, 
Wetlands Watch is um, one of the groups that we have that supporting of it. Um, and the other one is um, the, trying to remember, what is it? Yeah, the Gymnasium is the other one, which are both possible. Um, Life Lab has their, I mean, they're the ones that are supporting us within the schools, and they do have their office here. Um, the county of Santa Cruz County is true that they are, they're at the county office, um, but not the county office, that is actually the county office, but um, they specifically want to be involved with us because of some grant opportunities that we want. Yeah, oh, I'm just saying, like, if a spot becomes vacant. Then sure. You know. Thank yeah. you. And our parents definitely are yes. um, within the community as well. Back, but just for clarification, ah, side and the bottom yes. right, school district. So the organization, for clarification, the organization, Auto Valley Unified. You know, the person appointed by to that organization could live outside, let's say in Salinas, Ray, or Santa Cruz. I, I just sort of want the person from the committee being from the or the organization being from just the, 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 the community member. Because I think this community member slash. If it's, it ends up being five organizations, those five, those five people on those organizations could quite not necessarily they work for an organization yeah. within the community, well, but not they side. Yeah, the, I, I, I know it sounds semantical, but I think I'm just I'll clarify. Well, we what, will do our best, but I guess what I would point out is, for example, Wetlands Watch one, right? The Wetlands Watch one, they are been on our PVHS facility, right? So they definitely are linked to our community. Now, is that person that is representing Wetlands Watch, are they Watsonville or PVUSD um, where they live? I don't know, right? I think for me, when I'm looking at this, and I can, when I'm looking at this, I think, who do we want to have on here? understands and wants to represent TV, USD, and the area in which we live. Um, and so we can definitely do our best um, to have people live, reside within. Um, but I guess what I would say is, is we don't necessarily do that even for our teachers. So like the three elementary teachers and the two middle school teachers and two high school teachers, they definitely work here. Do they live within our community? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do, so I guess I get to stay. Yeah. But, um, but, but I mean, I would. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just saying, like, just for example, a community, you know, if it's just a, a community member. Then... I think he means, so we have, if it's someone not in an organization. Yeah. So if you have a regular community member, say my neighbor wanted to join, we want to make sure that that community member is a resident of PVUS. Yeah. Yeah. But if it's an organization, as long as it's somebody that works closely with PVUS, that okay, is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. So okay, like, perfect. You know, if, if, I'm, definitely uh, if I'm applying, and then Trustee Acosta is applying, but she lives in, in the power of, within the Power Valley Unified School District. You know, do we look at her first? first Give her priority. Me if, of course. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Like, wow. And I think that was like even when we were thinking about the different categories, I think that was really have PVUSD represented at the table, given that they would sort of immerse this type of really um, so interest getting drink. Well, and just like the native ingredient, once we're yeah. applying against each other, he lives within the power value. So just, and I just, I live in Gilroy or something. <laughs> Let's not 
start a rumor, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> I move to approve this item. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 What opposed? Item 9.9. .9. Random of understanding. Thank you, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. We worked with PBFT on a MOU for psychologists, uh, speech and language pathologists, and school nurses in order to give them a stipend, just as we have for classroom teachers when they are supporting either interns or um, aspiring teachers, and being sure that we can fulfill the requirements that the universities have in terms of having that intern credential and making sure that they have a mentor in order to do so. So the current MOU we have with them for classroom teachers does not address this group of educators, so we are making it specific to them, as well as making it specific to their salary schedule. They are on a different salary schedule that is derived from the teacher salary schedule, but we wanted to um, align it with their salary schedule, as well as the requirements are a little bit higher, um, especially for our psychologists, and so that is what this reflects, and so I request that you approve this MOU as I present. Good evening, President DeSerpa, board members, and Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, the following item is a new class description titled Transportation Routing Specialist. Um, Katie Bajazi, our Director of Transportation, and her administrative team reviewed the needs of their department and found that they had a need to utilize their routing system uh, TransFinder in a more comprehensive manner. Um, the district did not have a class description that described the work that they needed um, to oversee the TransFinder system, um, which would include work such as building and modifying routes for operational efficiency and student safety, working with TransFinder to work in connection with our student information system, which would ultimately uh, bridge a communication gap so that sites can readily access route information so they know which students are on which routes and also work with the Transportation Administration and dispatchers to troubleshoot and resolve routing and scheduling conflicts and uh, service issues. Um, the district did work collaboratively with CSCA on the job description, and the Personnel Commission did approve the job description salary placement at their September meeting. Um, so this evening, I ask the board to approve the new class description and revise salary schedule as presented. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Dr. Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees. I present to you tonight um, a request for an exemption for the 180 day uh, calendar restriction. As you may or may not know, uh, Certificated teachers who retire must wait 180 days before they can be employed by us again. This exemption would allow us to fill a need um, at Freedom Elementary for a bilingual after school teacher. So uh, I, re I request that you would uh, approve this resolution. Thank you. It is not carte blanche. This is just for one. So if somebody else wants to do this, we have to do another resolution. They're individually. Mm -hmm. I move to approve. Second. All those in 
So the state of California, so that's a STRS thing. State of California has a 180-day waiting period for retirees. Last year, that was waived for the pandemic, but it's been put back in effect. So this resolution allows um, retirees to... Yeah, I get it. Why is... I just was wondering what... My assumption is that they don't want somebody retiring and collecting retirement and then turning right back around and getting paid again. Because, am I close? Pretty spot on. All right. Um, yeah, it's actually exactly what Brian was saying. It's because when they come back from retirement, they actually don't have to unretire. They get to collect STRS while collecting their salary as long as they don't go over the limit. So there's a limit that STRS creates every year, typically around the 50000 or so. See? Around $50,000 or so. As long as they don't go over that, they can both collect retirement and continue to work and get paid at the exact same time. So STRS doesn't want somebody effectively double dipping and saying, I'm going to retire, but really I just want to retire so I can keep working and get retirement at the same time. So they put in a six-month waiting period knowing that at times people are going to have great needs, so they at least have a six-month waiting period. So Brian was actually spot. Can I actually... That is absolutely correct. PERS does the same thing for the exact same reason. Yep. yep. We have a Liz and Faith. Opposed? Thank you. One, two. We good? There we go. Good evening, President De Serpa, members of the board, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, tonight, to bring forth a proposal to adopt curriculum in support of our secondary newcomers. If you recall, uh, about four years ago, we brought forth middle school English um, language development curriculum. At the time, we also looked for components to support our students new to the country. Uh, unfortunately, at that time, there weren't quality materials. But fortunately, we, we now have quite a few opportunities to um, analyze and dive into to some, some options. One of the guiding um, tools that we use when looking at how to support our newcomers, not just for this pilot, but also just in, our, in the programs that we've created and the support that we provide, um, is the U.S. Department of Education Newcomer Toolkit. Um, one thing that the toolkit and also the English Learner Roadmap do is they really uh, they want to make sure that, that districts are looking at the typologies that, um, of, of who our newcomers are and also identifying key characteristics, um, implications, and, and needs of students that are coming to us. Um, you've heard me talk a lot about the EL roadmap. Our systems are for our newcomers are really trying to go to principles one and two, the asset orientation and needs responsiveness as well as providing our students with intellectual quality of instruction. Um, so we used those um, guiding documents to really look at these four groups of how are we welcoming, creating a welcoming environment for our newcomers, um, our high quality academics that we're providing them, social emotional support, and also the, um, the encouragement and support to engage in the education process. Tonight and for this, um, for this adoption, we really looked at number two, which is that high quality academic programming. How are we providing them the curricular support? So we started a pilot when Stephanie Pomplin, our new EL coordinator, joined us in uh, January. Her, one of her first tasks was really to dive in and how can we um, do a better job supporting our newcomers in secondary. And so she quickly got going. She got uh, high school teachers, middle school teachers of ELD, and then also some of our uh, EL specialists. Uh, we started this. We started this back in March. Um, these are the materials that we looked at, and um, in brief, I'll, I'll summarize this. We we have a proposal that actually takes two of those for different reasons. Um, we are proposing to purchase Get Ready for our newcomers for their English language development. Um, this does a really good job establishing foundations of literacy and Common Core. It provides some of the foundations in math, science, and social studies. Uh, dives into grammar and, uh, and phonics, 
and it really supports our newcomers who don't have strong um, foundational literacy in their home language um, or uh, have gaps in their, in their formal education. Um, there's more information about Get Ready on this slide and, and in questions we can go a little bit deeper. And then we, ought, we wanted to add on to that because we wanted a, a, a curriculum that could really dive into foundational skills around social studies and science, really um, build some of the, the missed content area um, for our students and, and dive in deeper with English language and the domains of the English language. So this is time zones and um, you'll see uh, some quotes here and in the next following slide from our teachers that have reviewed and utilized these resources. And there's a little bit more about time zones. And again, we can dive in a little bit deeper. And thank you. With that, I, uh, I hope you will approve our proposal. Um, Stephanie met with all of the teachers who are working with our newcomers who have been here for one or two years in, um, in our international academies, but also in the schools um, where we had them, like all the middle schools and all the high schools, and spoke with them, kind of laid out the curriculum, also with the, Engl the ELSs that we do have. The reason why I put it that way. Um, and, and, and kind of laid them out there, and then they, they looked at a few of them, and those were the two that really went kids together, where we got the most input from teachers saying that, A, the kids were really engaged in them, they were, they were user-friendly, but they also really delivered on, a, on almost a systematic approach when paired together in a double block. Yeah. Super we're excited. interesting. This is the great well, these commerce academies at Hills and High School. Right. Okay. And and where and where we can support our students either through ELSs or teachers um, where that when they're not in the academies. Well like Okay, and that was like kids will have access to Thank you very much. Item 9.1. Good evening, Board President Deserpa, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, and the PBUSD community. I'm Ben Slider, Coordinator of Student Services, and it's my honor to present tonight our proposed MOU for Positive Discipline Community Resources for your consideration. As you may recall, uh, last month uh, we were able to um, uh, start a partnership with another local uh, organization, and we were able to implement those parent classes, and uh, we had really good results. But we also recognize that. Um, every program is slightly different. And so what we want to do is help our parents be able to identify their tool belt, wear their tool belt, and be able to add the different types of tools uh, and share that with them so they can uh, better uh, be partners with the PVUSD community and work with their uh, children. Uh, we believe that the um, P, uh, PDCR, or Positive Discipline Parent Workshop, will complement the existing parent classes and workshops already being offered at the Family Engagement and Wellness Center. It is our belief that the families, parents, and guardians are partners in raising uh, our students to be college and career ready individuals. And so additional parent classes and workshops will provide the tools, confidence, and a sense of empowerment to work towards our shared common goal of increasing uh, readiness for college and career. So I thank you for your consideration and respectfully ask you to approve this new partnership.
comment. I'm just happy that we're um, bringing them on board. I know we've at our for in providing different bringing um I think it's important that we work as we talked about at our mic have more and more Hi. Anyone opposed? <laughs> Good evening, President <laughs> DeSerpa. I don't know how to do it. I do. Yeah. Um, I'm bringing forth a proposal for the Catapult con web content management system. Um, this is to replace our existing system, which is School Loop. Uh, uh, that's a system we've had for a long time, and it's really been having some hard times, and our staff's been having a real hard time. Uh, the Catapult system is a, well, first, let me make sure you understand what a content manager is. So that's the system that manages all of the school website, district website. So it allows us to create templates and give all the different staff members that need access to update different sections of those websites um, and post current content. Um, the Catapult system is designed specifically for education, so it has a whole bunch of education modules designed tools to um, post all of the most necessary web content. Uh, and one of the most important pieces of the system itself, and one of the reasons that uh, it's vastly superior, is it, it enforces ADA compliance with all the content. The school loop system currently, it, you're able to upload content that's not necessarily ADA compliant, so we're constantly having to go in and make sure that it is. It causes, it makes for a lot more work, and on all school staff as well. Um, so we put a group together, included certificated, classified management staff to evaluate the well-known best systems out there. We reviewed four different systems, and wonderfully, Luckily, unanimously, everybody uh, liked it. Um, and so just a couple of things that they really liked about it. Uh, it, it uh, the templates are really easy to navigate, to make the content easy for members to access. Uh, it's really easy to update content. Uh, it ha has a whole bunch of built-in tools that make uh, content management easier. Um, it integrates with social, all the social media platforms, uh, as well as Google. And then they have really great support Creating content. Um, so, um, anyway, yeah, so our plan is to transition all of the school website and obviously as well as the district website to the system, assuming that it's approved by the board. Uh, and part of that service and part of this contract is having them move that content. So it's not going to have a big impact on staff work. We're not going to have to have school uh, personnel recreate all the content. Um, and then the, the nice thing about the new systems and the new website is they're really um, easily navig navigable. I can't say that word, but I know I know what I mean. Um, and then, so it'll, it basically, it makes it much easier for parents, students, and staff to find the information they're looking for, to easily, you know, um, be able to access all of the different communication tools that integrate with the system itself. So uh, unless you have questions, I'm hoping you will leave this proposal. Any questions? Um, and right. Um, I, and how long will it take? Talking about it, it sounds to me like it would start with the district's website. That's like a main hub, and then go out to all of the exactly. school sites. 
Yeah, so our, our plan is kind of after winter break, some work will go in before, but we won't transition to live websites until around February. So the plan would be that the, we would still maintain our, in, our existing school loop website until each group of schools is transitioned, and we're looking at doing sort of three groups, so it'd be more or less 10 schools at a time. Um, so in other words, we... The, the, this, like, so uh, first we do, yes, we would do the district website first because that's what links to every school website. Like, we're looking at doing some of the work, but the website wouldn't go live until February. So some of the work would go in ahead of time, and then once it's completed, and, and part of this contract, we don't actually start paying until it goes live or until those school websites also go live. So some, a whole bunch of work will go in ahead of time until it's built and ready and tested, and then we would make that first group along with the district go live in February. So, yeah, so the plan is to have this contract, like our current contract, renew with our, at, at our fiscal year. So it would really renew each year in July 1st, basically, yeah. That just makes it easy right on the, the fiscal year renewal. Sounds like by then June levels. Yes, and then we would no longer obviously need to pay for school loop because we'd be done with it. Yeah. Yep. Sure. Yep. Yeah, so I have the price in here, the annual price for school loop, it, which is, it has gone up each year. So the annual price just for the software is thirty thousand. Last year, school loop was around twenty six or whatever. Yeah, about twenty six thousand. But each year they increase it around ten to twenty percent. And my guess is this year they would increase it probably more, just because everything's been going up. So it probably would be around thirty thousand for this next year. So, so the first year there's a little bit more of a cost because some of that the labor to actually build each school's website and then transition all the content. And then there's some training for staff and all that included in that first year's. Oh, you mean, yes. <laughs> I can absolutely say that it will be better. I know. Okay. Um, no, the, the templates really are a lot better, and they have much more modern components, and that's part of what we don't have in School Loop. And that, so, yes, the board's page will also. Um, one of the things about School Loop is that, like, there was parent, parents parents go on, and that actually caused a lot of issues, I think, in families. Yeah, that was phased out many years ago. It was. So okay, we, good. yeah, we used to have what was called School Loop Plus, um, and so we now have all that in Synergy, oh, right? Perfect. So okay. Parent View and Teacher View yeah. and students can look at their okay. grades. All that happens in Synergy. Okay, so, good. I just yeah. wasn't sure. We yeah. Were still doing. Loop. No, okay. not in school. Great. Um, do we have a motion? Hi. Hi. You want to pose? Thank you. Nine point one five resolution twenty two twenty. Sounds evening. like good news. Good evening, President Board of Trustees. Um, I have done another application for more electric bus. This one is the California HF hybrid and zero emission truck. Um, we were approved for Part A of the application and forward. We need to have a board um, and identifies an individual administrator. Um, the entity's funding grant would support not one but two. Um, so, bring our. We don't have any yet. In terms of, oh, we have 90 plus. So it'll be a third. 
And do we have the capacity? We will in future. Um, we'll have pedestals. Um, no feel like. Um, I'm hoping that it will will be a cost to the, but we will charge them doing charge management. So we'll charge bring off when it. A lot of we. It can be one of the projects we ask climate. Any other? Hi. Hi. Good evening, Rodriguez for a name that I know and this I'm the director of maintenance operation. Here to bring forward Hansold Elementary School and Green. There's a typo on this, boiler, HVAC cement. This is an ESSER project on this twenty six. We went for advertisement. Mandatory bid walk was held on the September 6th. Two contracts present at that time. September 20th, when we did our opening bid, we received one sealed bid from one contractor. Bid result up there for the amount of $214,609.77. The contractor was ACO Engineering System Inc., EDA Geoid Wilson, Mechanic Contractors. I'm asking for the approval board so we could move forward with this project for Ansold Elementary School. At the bid opening, there was only one. There was present. no at the bid. Was only oh, uh, the during bid the walk. bid walk, there was two contractors present, and during the opening bid, there was only one contract that submitted no bid. Okay. Project zero one. Good evening once again, President the Serpa, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees, Cabinet. My name is Edelino Fernandez, Director of Maintenance and Operation. I'm here to ask for the approval of Mar Vista Elementary Boiler System Replacement. Um, it is an ESSER funded project. August 26th, we advertised the project. A mandatory bid walk was held on September 6th. Two contractors were present during that time. Two sealed bids were received from the following contractors, George Wilson, and CRE Plumbing and Heating Inc. The lowest bid went to UH Wilson at a price $206,000. I'm here to ask for approval for the Mar Vista project so we can move forward with the project. Motion. 
motion to approve. Nine point one eight payment for nine checks for the hall district. Good evening, one president. This is Bud Doctor. Because he's it. My name is Arlindo Fernandez. I'm the director of maintenance and operations. Here to ask the approval for the architect agreement by Maddie, nineteen six architect. Hall District Elementary School roof and HVAC project. The project is estimated at $2,250,000. And their services for the design towards a complete set of fittable drawings include electrical and site work. That amount is $191,260 for Patty. Asking for approval on that. Question. Hey, John Hurley. Uh, so for this particular project, I know on these roofs, there's a lot of raceways and duct work, exterior mounted and exposed. So with this roof project, is that going to be a complete tear off and involve all of those components of the roof? Right now we're working with the architect, so he's going to be drying it up. So as we figure that out, I believe so. He's developing the scope, so he's yeah. what to He's, he's going to be developing so Just make sure right there's now. no, no uh, oversights on any of that stuff come back to us with change order down the road because they missed something. Just be real, uh, Making sure we catch everything. Yeah, be cognizant of what's up there and what it's going to take to get to get that done and done right. And then uh, you know, whatever else is exposed covered as well. Any broken conduit, anything else that falls. This is Hall District, right? Hall District Elementary, right. correct. That's in my neck of the wood. Make sure it's done right. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions from the member? Those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Hiding news. So for the last several years, we have had the, a grant in order to support the student success program at these three schools. So previously, that work was covered by a grant. Um, we have, we presented some data previously to all that showed that we were able to help support students that were on probation from reoffending and also having success at school due to this program. So this program, this grant sunsetted um, in September, and so the probation department came forward to us and asked if the COE would take on one half of the cost, because they do also go to a few of their county schools, and that we would take on one half of the cost. And so the County Office of Ed was willing to take on the payment process um, so that we don't have to worry about doing that. So this person will be paid directly from the COE. So that's why the con this contract, this MOU, is with the COE, um, not because they're necessarily going to be overseeing the people as much as they will be helping to support um, to ensure that they are paid properly and that they are working directly through the department, the probation department. And so we are asking that we continue this process, um, and they will be um, involved in the, uh, we have a multidisciplinary team that meets, and so they will be, they are involved, will continue to be involved 
with our meetings. We meet um, PVUSD, PVPSA, um, Watsonville PD, and probation. And so this will continue to um, allow us to have the support for So I ask for approval. In on and I would with anybody like I. I. One more? Oh. Close session item. Seven. Item or vote. Uh, Royal Valley Unified. Multiple sub We're excited. Now. <laughs> Good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. <laughs> and we say, Gary, Assistant Superintendent. And with me this evening is. Not Assistant Superintendent. <laughs> and you're, the, you're awesome. I just got to re. Um, so this evening, uh, we are presenting um, just wide data MTSS. We're going to be looking at academic learning outcomes and our multi tiered systems of support. The purpose of the study is to look at where our academic outcomes are and then how it relates to our um, MPSS system support, tier one, all students, tier two, is some students, and then tier three is for a few students, and it's all in support of academic. And the reason why we're doing it is making, ensuring that all students, when they graduate from USD, are career, life, and college. So, state tonight's agenda 
we're going to be focusing on the academic data outcomes and, um, and our action steps. We're looking at early literacy, advanced placement class, expanded course offering, equitable grading practice, and how it affects grades, and then state. So we know the classroom is where the action takes place. So we're going to show you a quick glimpse in a video of Pajaro uh, Middle School um, and differentiated instruct small group instruction. Group and partner collaboration can help students develop a host of skills that are increasingly important in the professional world. Positive group experiences have been shown to contribute to student learning, retention, and overall grade level success. Properly structured group projects can reinforce skills that are relevant to both group and individual work, including the ability to break complex tasks into parts and steps, plan and manage time, refine understanding through discussion and explanation, give and receive feedback on performance, challenge assumptions, and develop stronger communication skills. This is the glimpse inside a middle school classroom. So just like how Ms. Aguirre was talking about it tonight, our agenda, we're going to cover early literacy with Dibbles and Edel, move on to placement courses, expanded course offerings, equitable grading practices, and our state testing with SBAC. So the first area we'll cover will be our Dibbles and Edel, which is our universal early literacy screener. Um, the Dibbles is in English, Dell is in And so this two graphs should be familiar to you, should look familiar. Tonight, this is really how we look at the whole picture of the universal screener. And so the colors actually show you the, the need of support that our students are starting with at the beginning of the year, and then how they um, come out at the So as you can see, the key on the bottom, the red indicates intensive support, and so we have been focused on the reduction of the need for intensive support. You can um, pay attention to the first grade area, and you can see that we started with 70% of our first grade students at um, needing, and we reduced it to 46. So that's 24% reduction, which is key. So as we look at it, this just shows you just a we're going to dig deeper at that truly means because just because some of our students may have not moved out of that area, they also come in at a continuum at a different starting. And so we're going to pay attention to rate of improvement tonight to show you how many students are actually making a rate of improvement. And so our Dibbles is actually a normed reference test, and we look at the rate of improvement. The rate of improvement basically the typical growth a student should make at that given point in time at that grade level if they receive the effective instruction for where they are, right? And so tonight we will look at the rate of improvement and then there's ambitious or a rate of improvement which means it's beyond typical. They're exceeding the, the typical growth about 
right? So this first, this graph right here, shows you on the left side um, our kindergartners and first graders, right, that were in needing intensive support and actually where they moved to. So if I draw your eyes to the right corner um, for the, um, it shows how many of them, what percentage moved strategic or even core or beyond core, meaning very little at risk. And so you can see our first graders, um, they tended to, um, in the intensive, they moved, they had more students moving to the core, right? And you can see as we moved to second and third grade, it was not as easy for them to make that those gains. Um, and then as we're moving to this next piece, you can look at, when we're looking at our students in kindergarten, our intensive students that actually were able to make their rate of improvement, you can see is much lower, right? than our first graders over there. So if you're looking at our first grade students, these are our students that um, were, were strategic. Look at how many of them made their rate of improvement, right? So that's the two colors. So we have over, we have over 60% that were able to do that. That means those are the students that we were able to move up the quickest with the instruction. And then we're moving on. And if you look over, and hopefully third grade catches your eye, Right? So if we can get them, even our third graders, which were in need of intensive support, look at, we had 72% of them that actually made their rate of improvement. Now, that doesn't mean that they all moved out of intensive. That means they were receiving the instruction that will help clean up the gaps, reduce them, and move forward. As we're moving on, these are the individual sites, right? And so this shows you the percentage of students that were able to where they moved out of intensive, where they actually moved to. So you can see that we were moving, you can see Theo Del Mar up there, where their students were going to. And then um, at the bottom, we have Landmark Element. As we're moving on, this next graph shows you another smattering of where our sites are, and particularly when you're combining three data points. The students who, the percentage of students who actually moved out of intensive support, they moved either from strategic support to core, or they remained in core. That means they didn't regress. They kept getting instruction that was moving them forward. That doesn't always happen. So, we, so those are the combined indicators there. And these are really used, um, will be used to help sites also know, right, and to be able to um, focus on making growth. So as we're looking at some of the key findings, because you took a quick look at those data points, you notice that, first of all, we know that we want to see our intensive students in kindergarten. We want to see them make additional growth, right? And then another data point is when we're looking at our second grade students, the intensive ones weren't quite moving up and making as much rate of improvement as you can see the strategic. So if we're looking at those are some of those successes, we want to mirror and make sure we're able to meet the needs of the students in the intensive. And then lastly, that third grade. So that is something um, to be proud of, that we had 72% of third grade intensive students meeting their realistic um, or ambitious improvement. And then that strategic, that means like almost all of the students in strategic were making the rate of improvement. That's how we clean up and, and reduce and so the next um, slide shows you a picture of our EDEL, right? Our Spanish assessment that mirrors um, Dibbles. It is slightly different. There are categories instead of four. And so as we're looking at it, we have our intensive students. This is quite the opposite of what you saw with um, the Dibbles in terms of the kindergarten students actually were um, making their rate of improvement and moving forward quicker. But then you also see when we're looking at um, second and third, right, are not, students in third grade are not making the gains that they had on the dibbles, right? So there's different areas to focus on for either one. And so something to celebrate, if you're looking at Ann Soldo here, right, so they were able to move out 89% of their students, right, out of intensive, and this is, you have 39 of them moving into strategic and 50% moving. 
And then as we're moving forward here again, something else, and Soldo and Pitam remain up there at the top. You can see that 89% um, percent of the students there, again, those th the combination of the three categories, right? Moving out of intensive support, moving from strategic to core, and also um, remaining in core, right? Making sure that they're also getting what they need and make progress. And then as you notice, looking at Anne Soldo, 100% of their kindergartners that were in intensive made their rate of improvement. So they might still have students needing intensive support, but they made or surpassed typical rate of improvement, which is something to really um, celebrate. And then as we're looking at our um, freedom over there, and we're looking at our kindergartners strategic, they just switch places, right? And Soldo on that one, and another um, another um, data point developed. So in terms of just some key findings, right? We noticed that our kindergartners with Dell, they were having, um, they were meeting their rate of improvement, um, and surpassed the students that were taking it in Dibbles. Also noticed here that tech grade um, again um, did not reflect what it did in English, but we know that. That area with the intensive students, we still need to focus on and be able to support them with distributed practice. And then moving on to our last one is really that that growth in third, figuring out what we need to do to help third graders right make their rate of improvement. So I'm going to hand it off, to Lisa, with. All right. Okay, and so looking at our advanced course access and success, advanced placement course access and success in Baja at our conference. So the first graph is looking at the total number of grades issued across the um, as broken down by the. This slide um, is an indication of once students are in advanced placement courses, they tend to do really well. And so the shades of blue going from the dark blue to the ice blue, those are your A grades. Um, C minus, the, the other colors are the ones that are the Ds and F, or if you'll see a red, it means that it's an incomplete. And so generally, once students are in advanced placement, class, advanced placement class, classes in our district, they do do really well within the course. Looking at the individual high schools, the AP um, exam scores, um, this evening, earlier in the PAVAM report, they kind of gave you a little preview of what was to come. Uh, this is at Pass High School since 2018. Um, and then last year, 73% of the students who took an exam scored a three or higher on the AP. Looking at Pajaro Valley High School, Last year, 80% of the students who took an advanced placement exam scored um, three or higher. And as you heard, uh, Ms. Mason talked about 100% language, Spanish language. And then Watsonville High School um, is an area that we have an opportunity um, to look at our classes, and it was 34% last year. District-wide. Um, so one of the things I'm looking at district-wide in, so as our graduating class last year, 25% of the students um, took an AP exam sometime in their high school career and scored three or higher, which is one fourth of our students. This is our baseline when we're looking at our, um, I brought last month the A through G completion. So this is, that's gonna help us increase the number of students in the advanced classes. But a 25% of our students is a really good uh, starting point in our baseline. That are, those are students who scored or higher in their. So some of the key findings in looking at it, there um, were a lot more AP courses offered at Aptos High in the variety, followed by Watsonville High School and then PV High. Even though Pajaro Valley High School has the least amount, their students, 80% um, of their students who took um, an exam scored higher. And then um, the AP courses where students um, had an A, where 50% or more of the students received an A in the course, or an AP research, AP seminar, AP physics, AP Spanish literature, and AP Spanish language. And so those are the courses that 
really well. Next, we're going to look at our expanded course offerings. We're looking at our expanded course offerings. Um, we are a believer, and you've heard um, Dr. Rodriguez talk about student voice and choice and following their talent, um, passions, talents, and interests. So instead of the uh, traditional English 1 courses, we have um, a different number of okay? um, And then that goes also with world history and with other um, courses, whether it's CT, ethnic studies, and study, just a variety of different courses. And with looking at English, um, we looked at English 1 as compared to Sadai, English 1 Sadai, and then writing uh, stage screen. And when looking at this, students enrolled in writing for stage and screen and I had better outcomes than students enrolled in the traditional English. So the blue, once again, are, 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 are the shades that we would like. Um, looking at world history, ethnic studies and world history, traditional world history, students, um, there was 13, almost 4, is 14 percent. Um, this didn't show because it was rounding, and I should have left the numbers a little longer when um, calculating the percentage, but it roughly 14% of our students um, had less F in um, the world F studies. And so um, overall, there are more students passing with an A through G minus, which means that they do receive the A through G credit um, courses in um, expanded course offering versus traditional. Um, some of the expanded course offerings had more positive impact on students than others, and so this is something that we'll be looking at. And then overall, when looking at students enrolled in the courses, we had a higher number of English learners um, enrolled in the expanded course offerings than we did in the traditional. So even with that, our students are doing better. And looking at equitable grading practices, and so you might think, what does this mean? Um, equitable grading practices um, is when a grades based on students' um, mastery of the standards and skills. Additionally, the lowest grade in the course that a student can receive is a 50. Um, this is because when on um, a, a grading scale, an A is 10 percent, um, B is 10 percentage points, C is 10 percentage points, B is 10 percentage points, and then when you have an F, it's 6. So sometimes when students, they don't turn an assignment, it's zero. If you have it where it's an equitable grading scale, where each one is worth 10%, then that lowest grade is, in, is 50, just like the lowest B. And so that's one of the things. The other thing is that there isn't um, like work habits or um, how many times you participate. So it's really based on the student's knowledge and skills that are expected within that course to make sure that they understand the standards. Um, and it's mathematically. So we're looking at, um, we've had teachers who are in equity, they're in a, a pilot group and they're working with the County Office of Education. And we have teachers in all subject areas and at all of our different schools. And so we pulled students from the, stu the, from the teachers that are in the grading pilot who have our, um, who use this method versus the traditional um, uh, grading practices. What we saw with SPED and we looked um, with our students, with our teachers, so our special services teachers, we look at the courses on your right-hand side. Those are all in class. Um, and if you look, the blue is the A C. And then, um, like I mentioned, the red would be a And so you see the students who are in class, the pilot, um, their grades paired a lot better. If we look at the English, um, it is the English is 31, no, 13 percent less math. Spanish, 31 percent um, less C's and F scored by students. Social science, you're seeing the same trend. And then that, once again, the courses that we looked at were the ones on the right hand side. And science as well. So some of our key findings on looking at it, um, teachers who participated and who learned and did the equitable grading practices issued significantly less Ds and Fs in their um, And then in, also in the analysis, we looked at student map test scores to make sure, well, what if students who were placed in that score had higher map test scores than students who were not with 
And what we found is that there was no difference in the MAP test score. So it was, there was not a difference in the student's ability within between the. And I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Kloppenbach. Over. Here. So if you travel back in time with me, last time is the last year taking the S back. And as you are looking at the levels orient you, that where students are not, um, standards have not been met. And then we are moving up, the yellow is nearly met. And then we start moving into the green, which the standards are met, or the blue, which the standards have been exceeded at the level four. So we want our students, of course, at the green and the blue. And so if you travel from the left side from third grade, right, and we're moving all the way across to 11th grade, the trend in ELA is that our students are actually growing as they're moving up towards um, 11th grade, right? So there's tremendous growth in the middle. We have some ups and downs, but we actually have, we actually have growth by the 11th um, grade there. And when you look at math, you're going to actually see the opposite trend, right? We're starting a little higher in mathematics, and then by the end, by the time we get to 11th grade, we are not growing like we were in language, the, the different. So now, as we're moving to present day, past 21-22 um, results, we're going to start with our um, California, the, e the English Language Art and Math Achievement, it's called the CA, and it is actually our um, students with disabilities and alternative assessment for students, so they have the appropriate um, assessment. And so you're looking at the bottom, and we, of course, it looks a little different, but the orange right tells us that our students um, have a level, they demonstrate, um, this level demonstrate understanding of core matter in the content area. They're actively working with um, adapted grade level content that focus on the essential knowledge, skills, and may need occasional prompts and assistance to complete tasks and activities. The next one is the light blue or the ice blue, which Lisa was calling it, right? And they are a, a foundational understanding. And then the darker blue, the royal blue is a limited understanding. So we actually, on this graph, want our students, right, to be moving into the orange area, right? And so you can see our students here are actually doing better in mathematics on the CA than they're doing in the ELA. And now moving to present day 21-22, English language art SBAC outcomes. So again, we are matching what we did previously to the pandemic, where as we're moving up the grade levels, our students are actually doing, they're doing better by the time that they get, um, they get and grow up the grade level. As we're looking at this, we do notice that, that are getting closer to rebounding. So we're about, I mean, there's a range of about two to eight points, percentage points that were off from the previous time we took it. And so, um, but on average, we're between five and four. As we're moving to mathematics, we're going to actually see the op. We're going to see what we saw before, that our students are not, are not growing as fast as they were in ELA. But we are seeing that we're starting to rebound. Again, we're between four percentage and five percentage points off of where we were before. And so now we're moving down, or you can see a comparison of the, where we are um, with our English learners in ELA, math, and CAST. CAST is the California science test. And as we're moving there, you can see that our English learners, right? When we're our ELs, our EOs, our IFEPs, and our RFEPs, right? The, so our goal is we want to make sure 
that we reclassify our students. The more English and the fluent proficient they are, the better they do, right? As that, as that tells us in ELA, it tells us in math, it also tells us that in science, right? The thing is, when you look at science, is in science, our students are actually outperforming um, in math, how our students are doing in ELA and in math. And then as we're moving into another student group, which is our students with, that are economically disadvantaged, you will, you will also see this is why our students do, we get certain um, supplemental uh, monies, right, to support students that are economically disadvantaged. Because again, you're seeing that the students that are being able to meet the standard, right, um, are, are fewer if they are economically disadvantaged, right? So you can see that the no means they're not economically disadvantaged and the yes shows that they are. And this trend continues as we're looking at our students um, with IEPs or that are taking the SBAC um, in math and ELA and also our California um, science assessment. And, uh, and you will see that following, um, and that is why they need the, the support. See that we have a long way to go to support. Our next is our LPAC. So as we're looking at our LPAC, this is our overall um, performance. And so you can see our level four are the, are, is where we want our students to be at. You can see that um, three, of course, is the next highest, and then our, our ones, the level ones, the ones that are least um, proficient. And so we still have about 20%. And then if you look at the bottom, you can see that the level ones have increased. And so that, that is due to we have um, an increased number of newcomers. And that also supports what Mr. Berman brought to the board tonight to get approved, is that we have that newcomer curriculum to help and we're able to provide them with those support. But you can also see that in the level four, that we have also been able to increase the level two that are being more um, proficient. Mm -hmm. Right. So again, this is going now back to the um, IDEA, the indicator that shows our students um, with disabilities. And so again, the no means they do not have a disability comparative to the ones that the students we serve that do, right? And we see there is a gap, have some work to do, making sure that we are supporting our students with disabilities in number one. And so this now is an overall, right, of performance level by the domain. And so as you notice, our students, as, they're, um, as we move from listening to speaking, they are increasing, right? They are well-developed. Again, on this graph, it's a little different, right? We have our red being the beginning, the somewhat um, or moderately, and then our well-developed in the blue. So as we're moving down to reading and writing, these are the two areas that we definitely need to give more attention to. And you'll see that in our action plan that we're giving our students that best high quality grade level complex check and writing up. So I'm gonna invite Bagaria back up as we are going to go over, since you've got to see a lot of data tonight, we also have very strategic and intentional action plan across the board. So we're gonna to speak to a few of these um, across the grade level spans, and then also things that we're doing as, a, as an entity united. Um. So the first one I would like to highlight is, as you noticed in kindergarten, right, we had some of those early learning literacy skills that we, that we saw students struggling with and we're not growing as fast, so we do have we are um, utilizing a pilot in our ELSB schools and our full day kindergarten. It's Hegarty Phonemic Awareness to address and help support um, those pieces. 
And then we also, as you're looking um, in the center of um, the turquoise column there under elementary, text-based writing focus. As you saw that with our English language learners, our English learners and our um, non-English um, learners, that they really do need that, that text-based writing where they're interacting with high-quality, grade-level complex text and moving forward there. And then also, as we are a whole child, right, whole, whole family, whole community, district, right, um, we are continuing our work, providing that balanced um, program with Save the Music, right, El Sistema, increasing our Life Lab garden, um, gardens that will help with our science and um, really the, the career pathways for our students. And then in middle school, um, things that we are implementing on the school There is a process on the school sites where the school sites are looking at the students that are in front of them, the going to deliver the lesson. Really thinking about who's in front of them. Because from on the middle school from and even the high school from period to period, class can change dramatically. And so you can't necessarily deliver the same lesson to a different group of students if there are different needs. So strategically thinking about the students and what uh, anticipating um, what questions they may have or what scaffolds that you may need. This also includes um, more talking within the, the classroom, collaborative um, structure, so that students have the opportunity to have academic discourse. And really, and as we know, the, the best way that we learn can learn something is through teaching. And so the more students are interacting with each other, talking in those collaborative structures, the more the brain is remembering the information and knowing how to. Um, another thing I like to highlight is the science of reading in the middle school. Um, Claudia Monfada brought it to um, board, I think it was last week or the last time or the time before, and looking at our needs of our middle school students and having that go into uh, to the English language arts classrooms to ensure that our students have the support that's needed. And then also, um, one other thing I'm gonna highlight in middle school is the math pilot adoption. What we're seeing is at the elementary level, we really have um, a curriculum where students do a lot of thinking. It's very um, common core base. And then at the high school with CPM, it is also as well. And so elementary and high school lends itself to do a lot of critical thinking skills. And then middle school, there's almost a gap where it doesn't match. And so one of the things that we're seeing with our, um, we want to go back and there's going to be a group of teachers who go back with our director of uh, mathematics to look at whether the program is a good fit for our district or if there's something else that we can do that will align K-12. In high school, um, expanded course offerings, we want to continue to add courses to develop our students' talents, talents passions, and interests. Um, to ensure that they are connected to school and that they are engaged and want to be there. We also are, are looking at expanded uh, actual grading pilot. Um, not only if teachers aren't um, with the county office, there are two opportunities for teachers. One is a self-paced course that they can register through pickup that they will get paid um, by doing the self-paced course. And another is a weekly community of practice where they can be online with other like-minded teachers and discuss the practices and how they can implement it in classrooms. Um, and then expanded AP access. I was at Pajaro Valley High School today, and um, we're looking at the different AP courses. They've already expanded the number of students who are in AP courses and looking at what courses they're going to implement for next. I think with the scores that they received last year coming out of a pandemic has really um, fueled the um, interest in expanding the um, And then at all levels, the student, student voice through cogenerative focus groups, um, really looking at making sure that our students are um, having a voice in what they do. The family engagement plans, um, this is through our family engagement office, is how do we connect our families with our schools and um, student education. Um, the alignment of after school programs with Ms. Um, Littleton Bruno, um, putting that bridge there and making sure that we're supporting students in the school, nine to 10 hour school day. Um, and then really looking at um, the digital program adherence and making sure that, that what's being done at the school day is not just because, but there is a purpose for the work that students are being asked. Now we're gonna move on to our academic tiers of support, which we'll just touch on a few pieces. So 
so really we want to start by giving all of our students the best first instruction and that calls for a focus all across levels too on our intellectual preparation process with our core actions and ensuring that we have high quality grade level standards based instruction with distributed practices meaning opportunities for kids for our students to practice and receive feedback on the concepts and skills they are receiving instruction on. That means throughout the day, because we know we need our students to practice that certain. And then also making sure that we are focusing on intentional learning communities, which are those collaborative structures for our teachers to be able to look at data through data review team meetings, student artifacts um, during their PLC time. And then as we move up and provide tier two um, support, that would be pairing that distributed practice, right? The specific skills and practice with feedback that our students need with evidence-based um, interventions that we are progress monitoring, meaning checking in and seeing if it's actually working so we're not doing the same intervention and we're not seeing an impact on our students. And then lastly, making sure that we are aligning and utilizing the whether um, our resources, whether it's intervention teachers or instructional assistants or even the after school program support to really be able to support our students and give them what they need to connect it to. Um, um, and then lastly, um, the specialized evidence based intervention programs that are connected, it's missing that last part, connected to core instructional materials, making sure that we're not just giving them the top tier, the top three the tier three instruction, but then they're missing out on the other four instructional pieces. And so they're get, getting a layered approach and that we're monitoring the effectiveness. So we're not doing and doing and doing and adding without making sure that we're giving them what to help them make their rate of improvement. So with that said, Um, greetings and thank you to the board for letting me speak here tonight. Um, I actually have to kind of look through my comments as I go. I prepared these, I believe, a month ago at a special board meeting when we weren't able to present. So some of my comments might touch a little on behavior and social emotional learning. Um, but I'm here to just offer the perspective of a teacher. Um, with regard to this academic data, I'd like to know how many of those classes went the entire school year without a credentialed teacher. How many of those classes were taught by interns or individuals that had a substandard credential? Um, how many classes basically went unfilled for the entire year? And what's that impact on our students? And maybe if their year wasn't unfilled, maybe they had a teacher for a month and then another teacher for another month. And when you're teaching a comprehensive reading program, you need that continuity. It takes time to prepare. It takes time to plan for those lessons. So when students are in those early stages of reading, they really need that consistency that only a highly qualified and trained teacher can provide. Uh, also, um, the possible expanded course offering. Who's going to teach those courses? If we were to move to a schedule that has more periods, well, that's more work with less time and less time to plan. So when we talk about expanding our course offerings, we really need to be mindful of the staff that we have in place and how burned out the staff already is. Um, our students are suffering ac academically, not just because of COVID, but primarily due to this district's inability to retain and recruit highly qualified teachers and campus supervisors, bus drivers, custodians. We really need to look at where our money and where our investments are going and invest in the people that make lifting up our students possible because it's not just the teachers, it's everybody on that school site, it's all of you, and we really do need to do everything we can for our students because we're in a crisis right now. So thank you and good evening. I'm, I'm heartened to see the, uh, the, the 
the level two dis um, distributed practices and evidence-based interventions. Um, I'm hoping that between that and some of the leadership changes that have occurred since the end of last school year and, and now that Renaissance will be able to get back to exactly that. And, um, and also I think to, to Brandon's point, if we did get back to like what worked, what's proven on site, then um, I think we'll have less uh, retention problems. I was also glad to see on here the, um, the culturally relevant um, curriculum components. I think that's really good that we're doing that. Um, one thing that I would kind of ca caution with um, the equitable grading is sometimes in other districts where they've done this, like sometimes it might not be fair to s some students who, like if you tried hard and then you got like a, a 45 that you really earned compared to the kid who did like nothing um, and then you get the same grade. It's just something to think about, about that lower end, how you, where you draw the lines. Um, another thing that I wanted to bring up is uh, regarding CTE. I know for, as Renaissance prepares to have a, a second full month of one science position to combo CTE, not go unfilled. I think maybe it's a good time to consider a new CTE pathway, maybe something um, that utilizes our, our latent auto shop, maybe something in like the auto tech world that's gonna get students more excited. Um, something to think about. Also, I like the after school program component. That was another key part of our old um, system where we, if you were having attendance issues, we had on campus a culture that encouraged you to make up your time. That's another area where we could use support from the district office is when there's chronic attendance issues for the district to come in and help with that. But not just like currency court, like home visits. Thank you. Um, we present. We have any from our very much. I had a four question. Uh, All right, hearing about the grade, what about, you know, I wanted to know, um, do you have any, is are there any studies like Twitter? Are there studies, you know? Yes, there are a lot of studies out there in terms of. I would. It is, it is um, based on so a couple of questions I received from a teacher elementary school in my district. Uh, one question was, how could the Pajaro Valley Unified School District provide teachers with more time to complete these MTSS forms? Another question was, how can TVSD provide more teachers with more time to collaborate with their colleagues on these MTSS forms. And the last one, is it possible to bring back collaboration days and super subs to support teachers in implementing this MTSS process? Um, okay, so um, I'll take the questions in order from the last to the front. Um, right now, we, we do not have um, subs. Um, so one of the things that, as you know, what we're trying to do with the professional development or the MTSS teams getting together or looking at um, the teams is that we try to um, find other times other than the school day because of um, the lack of sub. Um, back um, before COVID, it used to happen and there was a lot of collaboration days. And sometimes when we're, we went through the pandemic and coming back, we really want it to be like it was when it used to be, but, and we'll even, possibly get there or we may need to completely pivot. So some of us, we have those habits built into us. So um, not um, as of now, we can't do the super sub. Um, in terms of the MPSS forms, depending on the school site, there are times built in where that the teams get together by grade level and they're looking at the student work with someone going through and there should be time built in during the school day. On to that, so um, our Principals have also adjusted when students are, and they are pulling grade levels together, often to work with the MTSS improvement plans. 
that our students have the goals and the intervention appropriate. They have also identified that we are trying not to utilize subs, right? Instead of pulling a group of subs, they might be able to at a time on a day where there's somebody available to try to get one and like a one on one meeting. Post Thank you very much. If I could just, can you just go back one slide? So, if years and years ago, um, especially those that have been on the board for a while, will remember that people used to talk about RTI time. And now I am starting to hear people say MPSS time. And so I just want to help clear that up. So MTSS is a, is a structure in which we provide support. So MPSS is actually, is actually what you see here. It's focusing on the tiered approach with the belief that all students need tier one a portion of the students tier two, and then a very small portion need tier three. Um, so when people say that they're filling out the MTSS forms, they're actually referring to the SST forms when students are not able to hit um, these goals. And so what we're trying to move forward on, um, because it, as in is, is most systems right now, the MPSS structure is supposed to be like this, but it's really upside down. It's inverted, right? So we have too many students that are not getting what they need through tier one. So that's why we're focused so much on things like SIP, because we have to have that really good first core instruction. Because if we do, we will never, if we always focus just on intervention, we will never get for that. And then tier two, is now we're is distributed practice where we're using those IAs, we're using those intervention, right? And so we're trying to help students to not get themselves here. So in this district, we are now at percent of our students are in special ed services. We have looked, and what I will tell you is the longer a student stays in special education, the larger the gap grows. So having the student move from general education to special education has not shown in this very district to help accelerate growth. Because when we looked at it, we actually saw that over time, students, their, their span is actually growing, not. And so um, I, I just am hearing um, misunderstandings and misuse of terminology, and I just the board to help the board to understand the MPSS talking about the overall structure of how we provide support. And then, yes, they are linked to those two forms, but this is not to do this, you don't actually have to fill out an MPSS, right? Um, but it is linked to intellectual prep that is talking about, um, which really is the tier one in the. Thank you both you. Um, questions. Um, you a lot of the portion of your level. Um, my question to you is um, also about enrollment, like with high school in the local, and what are we we tracking that that performance as well because of those that that benefit. Double dip, the key it's they're getting their high school credit as well as earning grades at the high school level as well as do, you know, and I'm not trying to put you on down, but it may be that future. And if you also know, like, what sort of number of high school are involved, particularly, um, it actually, all, yeah, all of the schools, I know there's students enrolled in, um, I was up today, and they, they also utilize um, 
yeah, Cabrillo College as well. Um, off the top of my head, I don't have the exact enrollment, but that is something that we can bring back, that we do look at the numbers who do courses at Cabrillo and at the different high schools, um, and students take it for a variety of reasons as well. And so we have very high-end performers who take um, classes at Cabrillo, whether it's to get ahead or to start earning college credit. And then also we have students who take courses at um, Cabrillo so as credit recovery to um, replace one of the courses that didn't do well. So it is a great opportunity um, for our students in our system. I, I would really like to um, see some of that in data, and including um, number of students across our high schools at, right, yes, at Pacific Coast Charter, um, our charter schools as well, um, and, and look at it also on the percentage level, the percentages that are not part Definitely can just give you a little dabble of information I have off the top of my head is just random. So we do have four articulated courses. So those are courses that are taught by our teachers, but if the students get an A or B, then they can get college credit as well. And then we have six dual enrollment. Um, but we can definitely get the numbers that are in the course. Um, but there are 14. And we have four pending dual enrollment. Definitely. Perfect. Number that is what the underperformance of. Well, with the students, when they score the, the score they have, it's that they're not um, as prepared uh, um, to receive get a score. And that is the wise. It could be multiple factors. Um, and so because there are many classes at Watsonville High, um, there are some courses that fare better than others. Uh, one of the things that we did um, summer eight, where um, teachers go to the eighth institute in the summer so that they are prepared. Obviously, us uh, High has more, so we want all have the level of I, I did just want to say for PV High that they you are carrying a class of at this time now they have a little bit more but at right. this year they had about 400 students and Watsonville High had about units 100 units so they're both up this year from that number but um, proportionately PV High is not that much lower just considering how many more how fewer that they have because this is a raw number. And so I'm not saying that those two don't fail in comparison to Aptos High, they do, but PV High and Aptos High have the exact same number pretty much mm -hmm. about it, but what High does have quite a bit more. So having an extra 100 mark is not that. I mean, it is, there is probably still a different portion, but it's not.
Yeah, that, I mean, that would be. So with this, if we look at it here, it's the number of the percentage that. Right, broken down by. I mean, this, this is. Uh, this is at plus high. So oh, this, this is, is at. Yeah, so this is the percentage of the students um, who scored a three or higher. So that it's so we broke that down by school. Um, one thing. Have this. Yes. Yeah. This is um, par. Going back to the one like that. Mike. Well, so this see is that there. Yeah, this was just to show the volume of the number of um, grades given by the school, so that there are there are more offerings um, with more more students. So with the advent of distance learning, about all these AP kids at other schools access learning in Um, that would give people a lot more access to an array of things that they're interested in and do well in. I would think, though, instead, we would want to increase it off at site so that it doesn't matter the school that you go to, that you have that opportunity. And that's where we want to, that's what we want. And so each of the schools, um, we're looking at what they, what they do offer. And I know it's something that we've been talking about, um, and it has been something on the board, but it's something that we are going to live out and act increase. And this is, I'm saying these are our baseline scores. And for us coming back through the pandemic, we're one of the things that we look at it and we look at it in one light and we forgot that we, our students were off for a year and a half. In light of that, it's, it seems if, if we take that out of the context, it seems like we have a lot of work, but it's actually, I'm in, I feel good at where we are right now. How much we didn't lose, and so this really is the baseline. And that A through G completion grant that we just brought actually asked us to look at it, and I and we included that on purpose, the AP course offerings, because that is something that we want to hold ourselves to make sure that we do move, because we have been talking about it for some time. And so with that completion grant, we do have to bring the data back and really hold ourselves accountable to make the movement happen. Those are very lofty things to work for. And in the interim, um, it's the same that we do a lot of training. Take the special build one, it's not place. So if we have awesome, beautiful, oh, how did, I don't understand why we can't. And like, yeah, you don't have to answer now, but I'm just saying, I think we should, yeah. So it has to be negotiated. Okay, well, so start negotiating. <laughs> okay. Um, I know you didn't talk about this, but I want to bring it up a minute. The Paso a Paso. We got, um, roll that out. Early literacy? Oh, five, five million. Okay. So is it as fully utilized? Yeah, we've read um, over 209 million words. So that's for our youngest. Um, so that is for our school and um, our kinders. But we use other programs. So yeah. Are we saying the bit of that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's a little bit challenging because what is what is it that's working, right? We have all have a convergence of projects. I will say, and all I know, some of you received it. I will forward it. Or we'll make sure and put it in communication. But I just have to say, um, there all there already was a report that was put out that we are one of school districts that actually rebounded to their prior their thousand night level so although we're like oh, all we did was rebound we were one of few that even made this success so when we're talking about a few percentage points many went down by 10 50 percentage points didn't rebound as well as we did um and so you know i just i would i would tell us we do have to have some with the system um and I think that everyone has done a pretty fantastic job of getting our back. We're, we're going to be talking about an equity audit soon, and we're actually going to be specific focusing on AP because when we look at the steps that we didn't complete, one of them was right, and that was um, because it, year three, which is when we were going to tackle AP, is right. And then um, and so that is something. So the comments that you're going to hear from me don't have anything to do with level of success because I am incredibly pleased. So I'm so just sad about us bounding. Not we did as well as we did. So you guys are doing it. These are just questions. But so tell me about Alex. Did you say? And we might that will we give Alex for that aligned with other so big ideas is our middle school adopted curriculum um, and that is the one that we're looking at. we use Alex in the middle school for different reasons um, one of them is whether if we do not have a um, where we need it that's the, the it's the big ideas Alex today um, where where we need it and then big ideas is the done so well in literacy um the SS, so when you're talking about MTSS, MTSS um, and their forms that need to be filled out. Those, you say those are to me like there's false. We're only kids that are. So it would be for their most vulnerable kids that are not their lowest guidance. So you might say a class of 24 might have five that sleep for those five six yes that is a possibility but the system that's in place now where we rolled out elementary so as we go up in the grade it may look a little different because you have so many more students in the second you want to remind the board too that this is our fourth year or third and a half utilizing the MTSS improvement plan in element and that it replaced all of these other documents right that just had to fill out and check in with and and send home and um, notify and, and check in with parents this is replacing it they have to set a goal but a rate of improvement 
or an expectation. Check in and identify intervention, make sure that we're coming back on it, the student growth, make sure it work, as opposed to having to do all of this paperwork and then coming back with an essay. We weren't able to, to implement intervention. This is really helping our students first make sure that we are putting something in place and it's taking the load off of the from the multiple. All right, I forgot there's more. Yeah, good. This is just a Hey, thank you. On our next board meeting, regular board meeting scheduled October 12th, everybody. Yeah.